Hey there, Mr. Reddit here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled Parent Stories. Today we have a very special episode for you, a compilation of some of the greatest Entitled Parent Stories we've read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most Entitled Parents you've ever heard of. And by the way, Karen assured me that if this video gets 1000 likes, she won't try to speak to anyone's manager for an entire week. So please smash that like button. And if you're new, subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. And become an official member of the ReArmy today, and I'll give you a shout out in an upcoming video. R slash Entitled Parents. Entitled Mom says I don't need a car, even though I have to work, then tries to take it. I'm sorry if this seems like a long rant, but I'm so furious right now. I need to get this off my chest. A little backstory. Right now, I am a student in college pursuing a degree in child development psychotherapy. This semester, I got an internship at a local mental hospital so I could get some experience and make it easier for me to get into grad school later on. The hospital I work at isn't just a facility for short-term patients though. Some of the people who live there are permanent residents, ranging in age from 6 to 78 for various reasons, but I won't name specifics out of respect for our residents' privacy. Basically, our goal is to do everything possible to help people recover from a mental illness slash episode and to provide a comfortable quality of life for our permanent residents. Needless to say, I deeply enjoyed my internship there. For now, all internships with the hospital were stopped until further notice, so I stopped going for a good three weeks and tried to focus on school. Then one of my old bosses called me, in tears, telling me how desperate they are for help right now. Once she had finished telling me about the situation, I immediately begged her to put me back on the next week's schedule. She agreed, and I've been working there ever since. Now, I don't want to come across as arrogant or pretending to be a martyr or anything like that. In all honesty, I think I am very underqualified compared to someone with actual medical experience slash training. But I know that these people at this hospital are dependent on us for care, support, love, and help. And I refuse to just sit by and watch bad things happen to these people. Simple as that. Sorry, long backstory. On to the actual story. Ever since I started working at the hospital, my hours have been absolutely insane. There have been times where I spent 48 to 50 hours straight at the building. I eat when I can. I sleep at three hour intervals so I can get up in the middle of the night and check on our residents and patients. I do my virtual lectures and homework while organizing patient files. As awful and maybe selfish as this sounds, I do try to get on my switch around midnight and take care of my Animal Crossing town. I'm weak. Basically, I'm lucky if I'm able to spend 30 hours at my home. That's where our entitled mother comes into the picture. If you have read the edit on my last post, yes, it is the same woman. You already know this, but if you didn't, basically she got arrested and subsequently lost custody of her son. Ever since, she has been absolutely desperate to get custody of him again. So she has been scrambling between family members trying to acquire things that make her look like a responsible parent. Baby gates, child safety locks, a new fridge, a new bed, countless new toys, I could go on and on. However, she went to her dad, my stepdad, for the most expensive thing she needed a car. My stepdad refused because he was recently laid off because of what's going on and we can't really afford to be buying something so expensive and not even be able to use it. I've been giving a portion of my paychecks to my parents to help ease the burden. It's not much in the grand scheme of things, but it's enough. I don't think we're in trouble financially, but if worst comes to worst, I would start giving 100% of my paycheck to them. After this conversation, Entitled Mom drove to our house. Yes, she drove she had a car and tried to plead her case with my stepdad again. I was sleeping in my room at this point, but my stepdad told me about the conversation and it basically went like this. Entitled mom. Dad, please. I wouldn't be asking if it wasn't important. Stepdad. You already have a car though. Yeah, but it's not an awesome car. I need one with heated seats and built-in GPS. Stepdad. I don't think a judge would really care what kind of car you have as long as it's a car. You are so selfish. I need this so I can get my son back and you aren't even willing to help. How could you let my baby be taken away without helping me get him back? Don't you think your grandson deserves something nice after what he's been through? Stepdad, 
I can't afford it. I'm sorry. Even if I wanted to, I can't do anything. Then let me have OP's car. Stepdad. OP needs that car to go to work. She's an essential worker. That's debatable. Making sure some psycho doesn't hurt themselves isn't really essential. I bet she doesn't even do anything anyways. She probably is just lying about her job. Stepdad. The answer is no. Get out. Figure this out yourself. I'm not helping you. I thought the situation was over after that conversation. Nope. I don't know how she did it, but Entitled Mom got my work's address and went there while I was working. I was on hour 5 of an 18 hour shift when my boss took me aside and told me that my car had been vandalized and she had called the police. When I went to look outside, I saw Entitled Mom handcuffed and arguing with the police officer in front of my car. Apparently, she had tried to steal my car by breaking the driver's side window and attempting to hotwire my car. When she couldn't hotwire my car, she got out, broke one of my taillights, and keyed a word that I morally refused to even type on my driver's side door. As pathetic as this sounds, I started sobbing as soon as I saw the damage. Maybe it was the lack of sleep catching up to me. Maybe it was the shock. All I know is that I was gross crying in front of my boss, Entitled Mom, and the police. Entitled Mom was yelling things at me, but I couldn't tell you what they were if I tried. I just went into autopilot. I gave my statement to police, confirmed that I wanted to press charges, called a tow from my poor car, and took an Uber home. I honestly hope that was the end of her crap for at least a while, because I don't think I can handle any more of her. Everything right now. I fixed my car as much as I could on my budget. I had an extra tail light, so I put it in. I put a trash bag over the broken window, and I used duct tape to cover up the word she keyed into the door. Sure, it looks super ugly, but it still runs. I'm just thankful that she didn't cut anything important. The ironic thing is, my stepdad's family is talking about pooling money together so they can get me a new car. When my stepdad asked me if I had any preferences, I told him I wanted heated seats and a built-in GPS. Oh, sweet karma. Bail hasn't been set yet on Entitled Mom, but all I know is that after this, she is not getting her son back. I'm happy for that though. That boy deserves so much more than she could give, and maybe now he will get it. Thanks for listening to my rant, you guys. Stay safe out there. Entitled Cousin tries to take everything I have. My car, my money, my boyfriend, and my entitled aunt is supporting her. Yup, you heard that right. My entitled cousin, who we will call Faith, tried to take away everything I ever had. And she loves my entitled aunt. Like, adores her so much that Faith would do anything to please her. She was very special to say the least. My aunt adopted a girl who grew up to literally be like the mini version of my aunt. She was rude, mean, extremely demanding, and her favorite line was, You can't hurt me. We are family. I never really paid attention to her, nor liked her at all. She was a spoiled brat. My cousin, I dubbed the Lucas, ignored her. Lucas was never neglected though, because our grandma was the one taking care of him the most, while our aunt, Brittany, because I hate that name, no offense to all Britneys out there, doted and adored her. Faith was ruined by Aunt Brittany, and now there's no turning back. I made a story about my entitled aunt who treats me like a slave in another story. Not gonna lie, I wrote it badly. I'm surprised it got so much support. Like, thank you guys. Real quick to clarify, my entitled aunt is Aunt Brittany. My entitled cousin is Faith. My best cousin ever is Lucas. And I'll go ahead and go by my username, CoolSharp, and my boyfriend will be called Thomas for this story. Let's begin. I was 17 at the time and it was Christmas. I worked two part-time jobs in order to make my own money and to be able to afford all the gifts I got for my family and boyfriend. We were all at my aunt's place for this Christmas. Some days were good and other days were bad. But it all got worse when my aunt adopted Faith. She hated me with a burning passion. First day I met her, I was cuddling with my boyfriend on the couch in her. My aunt, my grandmother, and Lucas all came over for Thanksgiving about two years ago. I stood up and greeted her all nicely of course, saying, Hello, I'm Cool Sharp. You must be my new cousin. I tried to shake her hand. She ignored me and glared at me. She just told me to not wear those disgusting rags and walked off. Now, Aunt Brittany spoiled Faith with literally everything. She got her first phone at 6, nearly every Barbie doll, expensive clothes, got her first credit card at the age of 10, and she didn't have to break a sweat. 
She's younger than I was, only by a year, but she tries to act so high up. Christmas was the best day. What better day than to spend time with your loved ones, excluding Faith and Aunt Brittany, and your own boyfriend? I pulled up into her driveway, my mother beside me in the passenger seat, and my father and boyfriend in the back seats of the car. I hopped out and grabbed the honey roasted ham and locked up as everyone shuffled their way into the house. Grandma had her arms wide open and Lucas was bugging me to hurry up. As I tried to catch up and not drop the ham, a high-pitched <coughs> caught my attention. This is the conversation that followed. Me. Oh, hey Faith. Faith, eyeing me up and down multiple times. What are you doing in those rags? Me. Rags? Oh, you mean my new clothes. I tried to walk into the house because it was quite chilly, but she stopped me. Faith. Listen, cool sharp. My aunt told me that since we are cousins, I get to have what you get. Me, dumbfounded. What? She's joking, right? Faith, now annoyed. Well, duh. We are both girls, and out of us, I am probably the best looking one, so we should share. I can even give you tips on how you dress. I shuffled past her, jumping into the house because it was freezing. I gave the ham to my father and took off my jacket, hat, gloves, and boots. I hung up my car keys and went into the living room. A few hours passed. I, my boyfriend, and my family all sat down together, talking and chatting and just enjoying the time, until I hear a sudden screech coming from outside. I hopped up and sprinted, pushing the screen door, and I saw my aunt smugly watching as my cousin, Faith, tried to drive my car. I hopped out, not caring about the cold, and stormed up to my aunt. Me. What do you think you're doing? I snapped at her, trying not to fume. Brittany, innocently talking. Oh, well, Faith wanted to try and drive, so I told you to get your car keys and she can drive your car. Me, annoyed. I never gave her permission. Now tell her to get out. Brittany. Honey. I hate when she tries to act all sweet to me. You should share your stuff with her. It's just her by herself with her brother Lucas. I ignored her and stormed up to Faith. She drove off the driveway and into the snowy sidewalks and got my car stuck. I told her to get out of my car or else. She got out, looking smug as ever, and threw the keys at me. Faith, I didn't even like your trash car anyways, and storms off, complaining to Brittany that I wasn't being nice and that I was so rude to her. I huffed and called out for some help. Me and my family got my car unstuck, luckily, but what was beginning to upset me was now she tried going after my boyfriend. She was standing close to him, laughing and smiling, playfully hitting him. Once she saw me, he got away from Faith and went straight towards me. I told Thomas to stay inside and I confronted Faith. Me, visibly angry. What the heck do you think you're doing? Faith. Oh, why, I was talking to Thomas. He's so sweet and I love... I stopped her, beyond angry. I'm very protective over my boyfriend and I get jealous easily. Me. Don't talk to him. Don't try and touch him. Don't stand near him. Got it? I was mad. Faith giving me a smug look. And what are you going to do about it, Cool Sharp? Why did Thomas even choose you? You are a pig compared to me. Me. Desperately trying not to scream. At least I don't squeal like one when I don't get my way. And I stormed away. Throughout my stay, over and over, Faith tried being and getting close to my boyfriend, and multiple times she took my car without permission and drove it around. It was so incredibly frustrating. I was going to go and get a few more presents in stores. I grabbed my car keys and then looked into my wallet to try and see how much cash I saved up. It's empty. My wallet had no cash in it. Confused, I checked my pockets, my jacket pants, and the inside of my bag, but still, no money. I asked my parents what happened to my money in my wallet. They had no idea. I told them I somehow can't find my $200. A couple hours later and my aunt and cousin walked in holding bags of new clothes. I asked them when did they get this? When did they go out? And it was right around the time I was trying to go out and get the rest of the gifts. Faith was looking at me snooty. Her nose pointed at the air and she was grinning. Me, angry. Do you know what happened to my money? Faith. Ugh, no cool sharp, but I did find $200 and it was so lucky of me. I decided to take my mother out for some shopping and look at all the wonder I cut her off 
starting to feel my blood boil. Where was this $200 found? I was gritting my teeth. Why, I found it in a bag. I don't know whose it was, but it was sure a lucky find. As she made her way upstairs, I went after her, but my boyfriend stopped me. Thomas, let it go. She's trying to get you to do something to her. He grabbed both my shoulders as I squirmed, wanting to fly up the stairs and literally sock my cousin in the face. Me, slightly yelling. I saved up that much money so I can buy the rest of the gifts. She went through my bag and took my money and my aunt didn't even say a word. I was shaking with how selfish and entitled she is. Just because she is getting everything from her mom, she ain't getting jack from me. Thomas hugged me and told me to relax, that it'll be okay and that I shouldn't be so upset. But oh, it got far, far worse. Ever since Faith took my cash, she's been deliberately trying to get me to give her everything. And when she doesn't get her way, she screams for her mother, saying, Pool Sharp isn't letting me have this. Or, Mom, she isn't sharing her car with me. Then my parents would have to get involved and practically drag my aunt back to wherever she came from before Faith summoned for her again. That Christmas week was the worst, and I still remember it. I had an entire headache the entire time. I bit my tongue every time Faith asked me for something she wanted. On the last day of that week, my parents and boyfriend all scurried into the car. I could tell they all hated the tension between me, my cousin, and aunt. I was the last one saying bye to my grandma. She was the sweetest thing during this time I was there. And Lucas, who instead of a cousin, I'd like to call a brother. He was there for me too. I made my way out before my aunt tapped my shoulder. Brittany, aren't you going to say bye to me and your cousin? Faith, how rude are you? God, I'm so glad I'm not you. Me, just wanting to leave. Okay, and I walked away. I heard them spit rude things about me, saying how Thomas won't stay with me, how ugly and fat I am. You know, the usual girl bullying type of thing. I was sitting in the back of the car with Thomas as my dad was the one driving this time. As we pulled away, I saw both Faith and Aunt Brittany glaring at me. That's when I rolled down the window and flipped them the bird, and we all drove on home. Have you ever had a cousin that you just couldn't stand? Or how about an aunt or an uncle? Please let me know. Entitled Mom has no idea how a VIN number works. This happened about five years ago, but I remember it fairly well. This mom was an interesting combination of entitled and paranoid. We've got Entitled Mom, we've got my coworker, and we've got the nice kid. I used to work at an oil change service station part time while I was finishing up my last year of college. It was really easy work. You don't really even have to know anything about cars other than the fundamental basics of what's under the hood, which was great for me because I didn't know crap about cars at the time. I didn't even change the oil. I just checked fluids under the hood and air filters and tire pressure. One Saturday morning, my coworker, we'll call him T, and I were just kind of sitting around as it was pretty slow when a car pulled. Finally, something to do. We pulled the car in and behind the wheel is entitled mom, with nice kids sitting in the back seat. This woman looked a bit old to be the mom of the kid who looked like she was about seven or so, so it could have been her grandkid possibly. The woman looked like she was in her 50s or so and had kind of hippie-ish looking clothes, jewelry, and dash decor. Nice kid is just sitting in the back seat, quietly reading a book. I stand at the terminal next to the car, smile at her, and go into customer service mode. Me. Good morning, ma'am. What can we do for you today? Entitled mom. Just a regular oil change, that's all. Me. Certainly. Just pop your hood for me and we'll get started. Coworker starts looking under the hood while I pick up my scanner attached to the terminal to scan her vehicle identification number. For those of you who don't know, a VIN is basically like a fingerprint for a car that gives all the necessary information that anybody working with the car would need to know. Year, make, model, unique features, specs, parts, etc. The VIN wasn't on the dash, so it's most likely inside the door. Me. I'm sorry ma'am, would you mind opening your door for me so I can scan your VIN number? Entitled mom looks at me dumbfounded, as though I asked for a kidney. Excuse me? Your VIN number, ma'am. I need to scan it, please. I believe it's inside your door. Why on earth would you need to do that? Well, we need to scan your car into the system, so we know what we need to service your car. Um, my car takes 5W30. That's all you need to know. Well, ma'am, we also need it for all the other necessary information to service the car. 
And besides, the system won't allow us to do the work without scanning the VIN. Well, what if somebody doesn't want to give you their VIN number? Coworker is looking at me from under the hood with an, is this jerk serious? Look on his face. And I myself am starting to get confused and kind of irritated by this lady's unwillingness to cooperate. Thinking maybe she misheard me or something, I say, ma'am, you do know I said VIN number, not PIN number, right? Big mistake. Entitled mom. I know very well what you said. Don't get smart with me. Me. I'm sorry, ma'am. I wasn't trying to be rude. I just thought perhaps you misheard me. Entitled mom. Now in Karen mode. I do not feel comfortable giving you my VIN number. And frankly, it's bad customer service to coerce me into giving it to you. You're obviously new to customer service. So perhaps this is a chance for you to learn. Now, if you would please simply change my OL and I'll be on my way and I won't say anything to your manager. Me. Ma'am, we cannot work on your car without the VIN number. I told you I'm not giving it to you. Nice kid. Mama. She said it with a long A at the end, kind of like a grandma nickname. So I think nice kid was her granddaughter. The man said he needs the number thing. Quiet, nice kid. What did I say about interrupting grown-ups? Coworker emerges from under the hood, stifling his laughter while making eye contact with me, which makes me have to stifle laugh. Me. Ma'am, I promise you. Entitled mom interrupts. I do not want my private information being compromised. My VIN number is linked to my address and other personal information, and I do not feel comfortable giving that to anybody at all. Coworker, who is still stifling his laughter. Ma'am, I assure you, your VIN is perfectly safe with us. We just need it to work on your car, that's all. Entitled mom. But what if somebody hacks into your system? I'll be compromised. Coworker and I shoot confused looks at each other and can't hold back our laughter anymore. Why are you laughing? Me. Why would anybody want to hack our system? That's not the point. The point is, I don't want anyone having my private information. That's my right as an American. Coworker still laughing. Ma'am, you do realize that the place you bought your car from, your insurance company, and any auto shop that has worked on your car has the VIN, right? And probably quite a few other places. No, they don't. I didn't give them permission. Coworker and I now bent over laughing at this point, making entitled mom even madder. Me. I 100% guarantee you they do. Are you going to change my oil or not? I don't have time for this. Me. I told you, I can't without the VIN number. Fine, I'm taking my business elsewhere. I hope you know you lost a customer today, and I will be contacting corporate. That's fine, ma'am, but I guarantee wherever you go, they're going to need your VIN number. Just guide me out. Coworker guides her out of the garage, and she squeals off. Coworker and I start laughing hysterically as he points to our smiley face sign at the exit door that says, Honk if you received great customer service, and says, Aw, oh, we didn't get our honk. Wonder where we went wrong. Next we've got, just fix it. I was in the military, and until re-enlistment, I was a mechanic. Not a very good one, but I could change parts with the best of them. This happened over 20 years ago. I did clean up the language quite a bit, but I think you will enjoy it. Our platoon mostly had good leaders, but we did have one jerk staff sergeant who was the absolute worst. When he arrived, we already had a motor sergeant and a platoon sergeant, both of whom outranked him. So he was assigned the job of managing our vehicle inspections. There were daily, weekly, monthly, etc. inspections that had to be performed. Not a difficult job, but one they assigned him to get him out of the offices since they didn't have anything else to do and nobody really liked him. Every Monday, the vehicle operators from the other platoons would come to the motor pool to do the weekly inspection. The mechanics were assigned a set of vehicles to cover. We would usually work the repairs that could be done immediately, like replacing lights or tightening loose bolts. Then, during the week, we would make all of the other repairs. And when we were done, typically Friday, we would sit down to order all the parts that we didn't have in supply. I was working when one of the operators placed his inspection sheet on the clipboard and left. When I looked at the paperwork, I noticed that his sheet listed a needed repair that was considered a deadline deficiency, a repair that must be performed prior to operating the vehicle per regulations. I informed the motor sergeant and he said that particular repair wasn't critical and nobody was really certain why it was considered to be a deadline. He also said that he would notify the platoon using it and would ask them to bring it back when it was convenient. Usually if a deadline vehicle was being operated, we would send the wrecker out to retrieve it. So I did my repairs on Tuesday and Wednesday 
and the vehicle still wasn't back. My work was very light that particular week and I was done with all the repairs by lunch on Wednesday, so I sat down to order my parts. In walks Jerk Sergeant. He instantly begins berating me for being lazy. He then asks if my repairs are made. I tell him that all the ones I could make are and he asks for the paperwork, which he flips through quickly. He notices the one truck and the conversation goes like this. Sergeant, is the repair complete? There's nothing written here. Me, no, but no buts. Go out to the lot and fix it. I don't want you doing anything else until it's done. Me, yes, Sergeant. Our motor pool had assigned spots for each vehicle. I looked through the manual for the size bolts for the particular part, grabbed the appropriate wrenches and headed out. I laid down in the vehicle's assigned spot, raised my wrenches and pretended to turn them. I laid there for an hour and a half wrenching air. Operators and mechanics noticed me but didn't say anything. Several had heard the conversation and laughed a bit. The motor sergeant was walking the lot doing his thing when he noticed me laying there. The look on his face was priceless. He either thought I had finally cracked, I was a bit high strung those days, or that maybe I had heat exhaustion. So he walks over and I could see the gears in his head spinning and he asks after a minute of thought what I was doing. I told him I was making the repair to this vehicle, which only added to the confused look on his face. And then he asks, in a tone of voice reserved for the mentally impaired, if I was aware that the vehicle wasn't there. So I replied, I know this, Sergeant, and you know this, but Jerk Sergeant does not want to hear any buts. He only wants me out in this lot until the repair is complete. Jerk Sergeant did eventually get in trouble, just not for this. He did have several complaints that eventually got him. But the motor sergeant knew me well. We had been deployed for a year, knew the situation, and he just laughed and told me to go back to work. He also said that I should have informed him of the situation so it could be resolved in a more productive manner. I quoted something military men have been told for a long time, follow the last order given. I have quite a few stories with this guy. Entitled Parent Breaks My PS4 Context I am an 18 year old male that had a PS4. It was 2017 and we were letting people come over for my birthday party. My mom invited 26 friends over and I invited 8 friends. Here is the cast. We've got Entitled Mom, Entitled Kid, Me, Friends 1, 2, and 3. Me and my friends were taking turns playing the game My Hero 1's Justice 2. We were having a good time and I kept beating my friends as fat gum. Here comes Entitled Kid. Hey, cool game, can I play? Me. No, sorry, I just want to hang out with my friends right now, maybe later. But I want to play too. I know, but I'm hanging out with my friends. Entitled Kid storms off going to find his mom. Here comes Entitled Mom. Why can't my son play your game? Friend 1. He's hanging out with us right now. Friends 2 and 3 nod their head. Me. I said maybe later. No, if my son can't play your game, then I will take the console. Me and friend one. What? Entitled mom proceeds to rip the PS4 out of the TV and break the wires. Friends two and three. You broke the PlayStation. That's not breaking the console. This is. Entitled mom throws the console on the ground. Me. What have you done? You wanted to know what breaking the console was like. I cry and go get my mom. My mom kicks the mom and her kid out and makes the entitled mom give up all the money for all my games and the PS4. I have a new PS4 now. It runs like the other. That is my entitled parent's story. How to scare a Karen After a couple of weeks of not leaving my house and needing some groceries, I threw on an old baseball cap, hadn't fixed my hair for a while, and ventured to my closest Costco. Being early, the line to enter was short, and I was able to get in, grab the stuff I needed, and get in line to check out. However, the line to checkout was not short. The store had established two lines approaching the checkout tills. An employee would direct you to the next till open when you reached the front of the store. The end of the lines, however, stretched back to the back of the store. I got in line and everyone was being very nice and keeping the prescribed distance apart and we were behaving in a civil manner. But of course, there's always that one person who just has to try to display dominance over everyone else. This one person, in this case, was a Karen. There were only about three people in front of me before reaching the front, where an employee would direct us to a cashier. Karen came along, looked back towards the beginning of the line, sighed dramatically, 
and pushed her giant Costco cart in front of the woman before me, making her next in line. The lady in front of me pointed out to her that the line started in the back of the store. Karen ignored her completely. A couple of others in line also called out to her that the line was back there. Karen ignored them. Finally, the employee directing traffic came over and told her that she would have to move to the back of the line. Karen finally spoke. I spend a lot of money here. Like, we all spend a lot of money at Costco. And I'm in a hurry. What's one more in front of them anyway? They've already waited this long. They can wait a few minutes more. I watched this go down, and soon the employee was arguing with her, and I decided that it was time to let my crazy flag fly. I'm no shrinking violet, and I don't embarrass easily, so I thought, why not? I walked up next to the lady and just stared at her. I didn't say anything until she looked at me and said, Step back, you're too close. I looked at her and loudly said, Do you like my shoes? Karen, bless her heart, looked a little shocked. Before she could say anything, I struck again. I like my shoes. Do you like my shoes? I then did what my sons tell me is my creepy laugh. <laughs> Karen's eyes got a little wide and I heard some laughs from some of the others in line. I then said, Can I go home with you and look at your shoes? At this, the employee once again said, Ma'am, please go to the back of the line. Crazy won the day and Karen left the line without saying a word to me and headed towards the back of the line. By now, some of the others were laughing and some looked genuinely worried about the crazy lady in line with them. I just went back to my cart and said, Well, sometimes you just have to fight idiots with crazy. Everyone seemed to relax and a couple of us chatted for the few minutes it took for us to reach the front of the line. I will admit, most of the people who were in line with me who heard the altercation were looking at me funny. But hey, it's not like they could recognize me because of the ball cap and mask. Jeez, I love freaking people out. Being old has its perks. Karen says she can control my hobbies. Cast. We've got Entitled Mom. We've got me. We've got a nice kid. We've got Entitled Kid. My mom and my younger brother. This one is a long one. I love movies and have posters on the wall, movie spaceships on the ceiling, and merchandise everywhere. Sorry for the flex. I also make home movies, most of which are not exactly PG. So my mom's friend and colleague, our beloved Entitled Champion, comes to visit with her nice kid and her whiny Entitled Kid for the afternoon tea. Entitled Kid goes off with younger brother and nice kid sticks with me. He asks if I had made any other home movies. I show him this 50 minute mockumentary movie, a comedy movie pretending to be a documentary, about the daily life of a crowded lodge in which I play a lot of characters. Dylan Brown, a stay at home dad, Reginald McPhilly, a wannabe detective, Rebecca Mason, a failing movie star, and Larry Johnson, an author who plagiarizes novels. It has quite a few swears. Nice Kid is laughing a lot and says it's good. Then Entitled Kid and Younger Brother come through just minding their own business and see us. Entitled Kid. What's that? Me. It's a home movie I made. Can I see it? I don't know. I don't know if you should. If your mom gives you permission, you can. It has some language in it. I did not know if I should have shown him my movie. I didn't want his Karen mom to get mad at me for doing so. Entitled Kid. Come on. It can't be that bad. Nice kid. Entitled Kid, he said no. If you want to watch it, go ask Entitled Mom. Okay. He goes off to presumably ask his Entitled Mom for permission to watch. Younger brother starts watching with us. A moment later, Entitled Mom storms in with a smug Entitled Kid. Why did you say to my son that he can't watch your movie? Me. I didn't say he couldn't. I just said he might need to get permission from you to see it. Why can't he just watch it? It's just a movie. It has some language in it. I skip to a bit where I know there's some language. Entitled Mom looks horrified as she hears it. How dare you show this to me and my kid? You are disgusting. What kind of idiot with no life are you that you spend your spare time making these? I am silent. I do not take insults well, and I have a ready tongue and can't stand entitlement. I shoot nice kid a this will be fun look. I stand up and get nose to nose with Entitled Mom. Me. I told you that it had language. 
It's your little goblin's fault for not knowing the word no, and your own fault for not listening to me when I told you. Entitled Mom recoils and counterattacks. How dare you talk to your elders like that? I am telling you to delete that tape and never make any other movies again. Me. You can't tell me what to do. You can't control my hobbies. Yes, I can. You are a kid, and I am an adult, so you have to listen to me. Okay? Kids should be appropriate, and if Nice Kid were to make those vile tapes, he would be disowned. I can control your hobbies because I am an adult. Now delete those vile movies, and you will never make one again. Me. Again, you can't tell me what to do. And this movie alone took four months to make. I had to script, make costumes, and buy props, filming and post-production, and hours of my time. So I will not delete this movie. It's like you've never done anything in your life, riding my mom and everyone's coattails to take partial credit and earn money, and you're just jealous that a 16-year-old can achieve more than you. I do everything at work, okay? You don't have to delete your movie, but Entitled Kid wants your movie camera. Now my camera is an expensive one and cost me just about $750. But Entitled Kid looks excited about this and says the cringiest thing ever. Yeah, then I can film videos of me playing Xbox and upload it to YouTube. I can't help but laugh at this and so does Nice Kid and Younger Brother. Entitled Kid goes red. It's not funny. Better than your crappy movies. Me. Oh look. I've corrupted Entitled Kid. Yes, high five younger brother and nice kid. Mission accomplished. Entitled Mom looks shocked. You have corrupted my kid with your disgusting films. Entitled Kid, nice kid, we're going. And she leaves. Mom is very confused when we say Entitled Mom has left. Nice Kid texts me later that night saying that Entitled Mom lectured her the whole way home about movies being nasty and evil and that only Disney is alright. Later, me and younger brother said we were planning a sequel to that movie with a new character called Karen. Thank you for reading. I hope you enjoyed it. Guy tried to buy my service dog. A bit of backstory. I have a wonderful service dog named Simon. He's with me for psychiatric assistance and helps keep people away from me so I don't hurt them and they don't hurt me or cause more panic when I have breakdowns and interrupts me if I do self-destructive behavior like scratching at my arms and legs is a mild example. I also just generally feel safer with him when I go outside. There are a few people that I'm afraid of in the apartment complex for good reason I won't get into. And he is fairly protective of me if someone suddenly grabs me. My boyfriend and I trained this into him due to the aforementioned people. Now, my first encounter was on a trip to our mailbox. It's not super far away and usually trips are uneventful. I had mainly brought Simon with me so he could use the bathroom. There was a man at the mailbox across the street with his son checking his mail. We'll call them Entitled Dad and Good Kid since he was actually pretty sweet. Entitled Dad approaches me with his son. Go on, ask. I'm a bit startled at someone suddenly talking to me and my anxiety goes up a lot, but I can deal with it. Er, ask what? I smile at them and he gestures to his son, who's probably like seven at the most. Can I pet him? Good kid asked quietly. Now, I absolutely have no problem with people petting my dog if they ask first. He wasn't in his vest or anything to begin with since I wasn't bringing him somewhere dogs aren't normally allowed to be. Sure, go for it. He loves pets. I crouch down and hold Simon by his leash to assure he doesn't jump on Good Kid as Entitled Dad seems content that I let his kid pet my dog. Entitled Dad speaks up again. How much do you want for him? I'm taking it back. I'm sorry, what? Your dog. How much do you want for him? Good kid really likes him, and he seems great with kids. Is he housebroken? How old is he? Is he up to date on shots? My mind started spinning. Like, I know he didn't know he was a service dog. Again, lack of vest. But he was just trying to buy him off me because his kid liked to pet him. I'm sorry, I need him. He's a service dog. Entitled dad cuts me off. I can pay you more for him then. You can just get another one. Now, Simon is, as I said, psychiatric. I trained him myself for nearly two years to react to my particular triggers and tics. Not that I would ever sell my best friend, but if I did, it would take way too much time and money to train another dog for what I need him to be able to do. I'm sorry, 
No. I stand up, and Simon walks back to my side, facing the two people. I guess Good Kid wasn't really listening, as he just said goodbye to my dog, but Entitled Dad wasn't done trying. He stepped closer, and I panicked. I didn't want him to grab me, I'm very small and thin. So I dropped down and did my best to fake the signs I was having a breakdown, at least physically. Simon put himself between me and Entitled Dad and Good Kid, just what he's supposed to do. Entitled Dad still reaches for me, and Simon growled quietly at him. Nothing aggressive, just a low and quiet growl telling him to stay back. When he does this, he has the tendency to tuck his ears back as a further sign of non-aggression. This set Entitled Dad off. Your mutt tried to bite me. He absolutely did not. I don't know how in the world a growl is an attempt to bite, but I kept myself hunkered down as Entitled Dad went on. I'm calling the cops and animal control, and I'll have that dog euthanized. He grabs Good Kid by the arm and drags him off to the apartment block across the street. I get up slowly, making sure Entitled Dad isn't going to come back and to make sure he isn't trying to be sneaky and see what apartment I go to. I hurry back inside and I guess he never called either place because nobody ever showed up to talk to me or take my dog. I haven't seen or heard from Entitled Dad or Good Kid since. I know that's not like a super satisfying ending, but it was still a pretty scary run in. Owner at print shop confuses me for a technician. Background information. Until recently, my business was still giving out wedding videos on DVD. The DVDs were labeled with custom stickers that had to be printed for each client. These had to be imported into Photoshop, positioned correctly, etc. The guys running the printers at this particular shop just never seemed able to master this skill. And usually, as soon as they finally did, they would leave or get fired and the process would restart. By the third time this had happened, I had started teaching the printing guys how to do it, which usually meant that I just ended up doing the job myself while they watched and as soon as they tried doing it themselves, they had messed it up again. As I was a regular that had been coming there for about 8 years and seemed to be the only person that could get my orders right anyways, the manager and I eventually came to a mutual agreement that when I came in, I could just go use the computer in her office and set it up myself because it would be quicker and would cost the shop much less than all the stickers they were wasting from her guys doing it wrong. This was perfect for me and went well for many months. A trip that had usually taken over an hour would now take only about 5 minutes. So one day, I had just sent my order through to the printer and I was standing by the machine waiting for it to print. When the owner walked up to me and started telling me that the printer was still getting jammed all the time, please note, the owner and I had spoken countless times before he usually even came out to greet me when I entered the shop. I assumed he was telling me this because he feared my order might get stuck, but I was dead wrong. To his initial explanation, I had just smiled and said, that's good to know. He exploded on me, telling me that's not good enough and asking me what I was planning on doing about it. At this point, I thought he was accusing me of having broken his printer and I just stood there dumbstruck. My expression changed when he mentioned how much he pays me. Wait, what? I asked. Suddenly, the manager came running out of her office yelling, Boss, he doesn't work here. The owner responded with, What? That's OP. He comes in here every week, almost for the last eight years, the manager said, looking super confused about how he had forgotten who I was. As she was saying that, the actual printer technician came out of the restroom. The owner looked at him, then looked at me, looked at him again. We looked absolutely nothing alike, and then suddenly grasped, that I wasn't the technician. Well, he shouldn't be back here then, the owner said sheepishly as he returned to his office. The manager apologized profusely to me and I just laughed it off. I guess she did get in a bit of trouble for our deal though, because the next week she told me that she couldn't allow me to do my own printing anymore and so we had to go back to the old way of her guys doing it themselves and getting it wrong on their first five or six tries. I wish to apologize to all the trees that were wasted while these guys tried to figure out how their own programs worked. No running for me. This was towards the end of my time in my unit and Pig's time in the army. I was changing duty stations, PCS, and Pig was getting out of the military, ETS. We had one buck sergeant who wasn't a great leader. He was promoted because he could kiss some butt like it was an Olympic event and he was going for the gold. Also, this one, Sergeant P we'll call him, was promoted in the unit after everyone knew him. It creates an interesting dynamic when you're promoted and placed back in your unit. 
While everyone must follow your orders, everyone knows the things you did when you were a specialist. It just makes it difficult to earn the respect of your once peers and be an effective leader. And let's be honest, most people are not natural leaders and it takes time to develop those skills. Many of the newly promoted sergeants had a difficult time adjusting rather than leading, they tended to throw their stripes around. And to top it off, Sergeant P wasn't even great at his job. I mean, I was one of the weakest mechanics in my unit and he was worse than I was. With a few weeks left in service, Pig started out processing. There's a bunch of stuff to do for this, one of which was the out-process physical. Pig did this as early as he possibly could. Any disability claims are based off that physical, so if you were to injure yourself during physical training, this would not be in the report. So, no physical training after the physical. Now, Pig was not an immaculate soldier. Like me, he threw the uniform in the dryer and brush shined his boots. Pig was a fantastic mechanic though. He was one of the strongest mechanics in our unit. He could also drive anything with wheels and was assigned to the wrecker. He was the guy everyone went to when they had an issue that they couldn't figure out. So, Pig did his physical and was sitting out physical training. A few days after the physical, Sergeant P comes to Pig and tells him that we have a battalion run and that everyone is required to participate. Pig informs him of the situation and politely tells him that running ain't in the cards. Sergeant P gets belligerent and begins yelling and cursing and just in general letting Pig know where he stands rank-wise. Pig at first just calmly repeats himself until he gets angry. Sergeant P was off the handle at this point. Pig has finally had enough and yells, Forget you! I ain't running! A couple days later, Pig is a private E3, disrespecting an NCO. From what we heard, some of the senior NCOs in the platoon were pushing P to just drop the issue and they would speak to Pig to ensure it wouldn't happen again. After all, Pig had been invaluable to our unit during deployment and he would be leaving the military shortly. And they all thought that Sergeant P was kind of in the wrong. I mean, Pig did get out of hand, but he wasn't wrong about the run. But Sergeant P was having none of it. He wanted to make sure that all of the other lower enlisted would know not to speak to him in that manner. I'm not sure you can call this maliciously complying with a demotion. I do. But Pig sure had some fun being a private again. Whenever Pig was asked to perform one of the more complicated tasks, his response was, I'm just a private. I have no idea how to do that. The motor sergeant asked him to do something one day. Pig gave his response in the most private-like voice he could conjure and just stared at the motor sergeant. The motor sergeant was staring daggers at Sergeant P, who suddenly had some official sergeant duties to attend to in his office and scurried off like a little rat. Pig did continue running the wrecker and he spent most of his days just sitting there waiting for a call or performing routine maintenance on his truck. Nobody really bothered him much. Aftermath. This is the funniest bit. I changed duty station shortly after this. My new motor sergeant was a good guy and a fantastic leader. He was one of those guys that could give you the crappiest task and make you feel good about doing it. I also found out later that he was an uncle that I never knew I had, but that's another story. So, about two months there, the motor sergeant hollers from his office. Apparently, I have a phone call from someone in my previous unit. What the heck is this? Is some jerk now trying to get me from afar? No, it was Sergeant P. He was calling to let me know that he was changing duty stations and had been assigned to this unit. Fantastic. The unit put you into a platoon based on your military occupational specialty, MOS. Because P was the same specialty, he would be assigned to this platoon. He had called the motor sergeant's phone number, so I had taken the call in his office. The motor sergeant asked me about it, so I told him. Then he asked more questions, and I told him all about the story with Pig. I was dropping dimes like a cheap slot machine. After spilling all the beans, the motor sergeant sat back and thought for a minute, then asked a single question. Can he fix a truck though? My response, about as good as I can. He told me that was enough and dismissed me. A few months later, P walked into the motor pool and came over to chat with me. Apparently, the sergeant had him assigned to the QC department. He didn't know why, he did like the job. You can either be a poor leader or poor at your job, but you cannot be both at the same time. Make me stay late and yell at me? No, I will not break policy. We've got me, the store manager. We've got the staff member working. We've got entitled mom and entitled kid. I was working as a store manager for a medium dress for less retail store. We carried mostly clothing and home goods. 
Due to being short on managers, I was closing the store that day and had to open the next day. 8.45 p.m. Announcement The store will close in 15 minutes. Please make your way to checkout. Customers started heading up to the front. 8.55 p.m. I noticed one lady with her daughter is still shopping with a basket overflowing with items. Announcement The store will close in 5 minutes. Please make your way to checkout. 9 p.m. She's still shopping. Announcement The store is now closed. Please make your way to checkout. The lady started to walk towards the front to check out, I assumed. I had to wait for her to check out before I could close out the registers and figure out the money for the day. So while waiting, I went to the office to quickly send some emails. At around 9.10 p.m., I walked up to the registers and began to close the registers. I finished up quickly in about five minutes. I quickly put the money back in the safe area and walked out. Walking by the fitting room, I hear voices inside. There were only two other employees on the sales floor and I could see both of them straightening items. The fitting room attendant was sorting clothes to go back to the sales floor. Is somebody in the fitting rooms? I asked coworker. Yeah, I think so. I told her that we are closing, she responded. Hello, the store is now closed. We are getting ready to lock up soon. We open at 9 a.m. tomorrow. I hollered back into the fitting rooms. Soon after, a very entitled lady and her daughter came out with a lot of items, picked up her basket of stuff, and said she was ready to check out. I'm sorry, but the store closed almost 20 minutes ago. We are open in the morning. I let her know. No, my daughter and I need to buy all this right now, entitled mom declared to me. That is not possible. The registers are closed and we are about ready to head home and shut down the store, I politely told them. That is BS. They always let me shop at this time. This is unacceptable, she yelled at me. The store is closed. You can come in the morning to shop if you'd like, I responded assertively. Fine, then I demand you hold all of this for me until the morning. I will be back when the store opens to get it, she told me. Now, due to us being a discount type store, we do not hold items, as we do not regularly get the same items. It is a company policy. I'm sorry, but due to corporate policy, we're unable to hold your items. We open at 9 tomorrow, and if you are here, then I'm sure they will still be here, I reminded her. What? No, these are my items, she demanded. They are the store's items right now, but tomorrow morning they could be yours, I let her know. Now, I need you to please leave. My staff and I would like to go home. This is stupid, and you are awful. These items will be waiting for me here tomorrow, and I demand to have your store manager waiting so I can tell him how horrible and stupid you are. I will be here at 9, she told me. The store manager will be here in the morning, I told her, smiling politely. Entitled mom stormed out, kid in hand, grumbling and griping the whole time. It was late and we were all tired, so we all got our stuff ready, armed and left the store. I get there before any staff normally to get the money ready for the day, along with my paperwork while it was quiet. I made sure to spend the extra time that morning to put the basket of items away on the shelves and racks spread through the store. Petty, I know, but it felt amazing knowing she might come in. At about 11 a.m., I was up near the front talking to the morning staff and I saw Entitled Mom's store man, already looking mad. I watch her not even look at us and walk straight to the fitting room. Shortly after, I get a call on my earpiece from the fitting room attendant that a customer is asking for me. I stroll back, a professional look on my face, calmly ready for the storm. I get back there and Entitled Mom looks mad. She sees me and says, No, I asked for the store manager, not some supervisor. Ma'am, he is the store manager, they told her. She gasped in anger. How dare you put my things back? I told you I was coming back for them, she said to me, her face now red. And I let you know last night that we cannot hold items due to policy. It has to do with the nature of our store, I inform her. So where are my items now? They better all be here still. I told you I was coming back, she demanded. The retail merchandise is all on the sales floor. All unpurchased items get put back, I said. I can assure you, they were here when we opened, but I do not know about now. Entitled Mom huffed and started walking around, stomping and huffing. She ended up finding some of what she had from before, but made sure to make comments to the cashier about how she could not find all of her items and she would never be coming here again. If only, right? I did see her other times, but she went out of her way to never talk to me or acknowledge me, which was fine. You have to date him. Backstory. My mom and Entitled Mom were really close and pretty much best friends. Entitled Mom has a son, let's just call him N. 
So Ann and I grew up together, so I thought of him as a brother. The idea of dating him never crossed my mind, so this ended up happening. I was around 16 when this happened, and he was 17. I had just changed schools because Entitled Mom insisted. In her words, my friends tried to peer pressure me into getting into trouble, which wasn't even true. She also insisted that I moved to N's school, which I hated from day one, since I was the new girl and no one really talked to me. It was at this time that N became more comfortable with me. He would often put his arm on my shoulder as we walked around school and hugged me constantly. So the day came when N asked me out, but I said no. That's when Entitled Mom interferes. I arrive home after school the same day and Entitled Mom was there. And this conversation goes down. Entitled Mom. Why didn't you accept? Me. What? Just like that, she starts screaming. You know he likes you. Why didn't you accept when he asked you out? Me. I'm sorry. I just wouldn't be comfortable dating him. He's like a brother. In enters the room, crying. How could you have done this to me? Entitled Mom. Look, you made my son cry. You need to date him. He likes you. Me. I'm sorry, but it's my business who I date. How dare you? If you continue like this, no one will ever want to marry you. Me. Marry? I'm sorry, I'm only 16. How could I be thinking of marrying someone? You're being irrational, and I hope you realize your mistake. Then she walks up to me and slaps me. By then, I had enough, so I locked myself in my room for an hour until my mom came up to talk to me, and this happened. Mom, I know you're confused, but you have to understand, he's the one for you. And me. You know nothing. Mom, that's enough. You're grounded. After one month grounded, I cut all ties with in and entitled mom. Today I'm 25 and married to a guy I actually like and never heard from in ever since. However, my mom still talks to entitled mom, but I don't really talk to my mom. What would you do if you were in this situation? Would you just date them or tell them absolutely not? Entitled dad demands my sister give his son her fireworks stand. This story happened a few years ago, so I might not remember exactly how it went down. Let's meet the usual cast. We've got the entitled dad, the entitled bratty kid, who is about seven. We've got G, my sister. We've got my dad and my stepmom. Well, most of my dad's family live in a city in the countryside of my state. I live in the capital. We were all there for my cousin's 15th birthday. It's a really big thing around here. It was mostly a pretty fun trip. Me, my dad, stepmom, her kids, and my siblings were staying at one of my dad's aunt's place. The party started around 7 p.m. and it was freezing, about 3 to 4 degrees Celsius. There were more than 1,000 people there. The main attraction was the barbecue, made with an entire cow of 200 kilograms from one of the relatives' farm. We had a great time, ate a lot, danced, and acted like kids. The party went on, my cousin arrived, she was gorgeous, danced with my dad, who was not only her uncle, but also her godfather. My dad later told us that there were going to be fireworks. I immediately get excited. I went outside and they started to set them off. My sister was holding a fireworks stand, the ones made out of cardboard. She was 20 at the time, but always seemed younger. Then approached a man, obviously had been drinking. He was about 35 and he had his crying kid with him. Before he reached us, he let go of him, crouched in front of him and said something that made the kid immediately stop crying and his eyes sparked with excitement. The guy left the kid about 5 meters away from us and obviously they were our dear entitled dad and entitled kid. The stand my sister was holding was out so she outed it down but there was more. Entitled dad. Hi. Sister. Hi. Entitled dad. So, what's your name? It's G. You know, it's very dangerous for a kid to be holding fireworks in your hands like that, don't you? Sister. Kid? Ah, okay. Thanks for your concern, but I can take care of myself. You should let the adults handle it. You know, only people older than 18 can buy those. Give it to me so I can launch some. Sister. Uh, I'd rather not. These are mine. The guests were notified to buy some if they could. Come on, I just want to give it to my kid so he'll stop crying. Will you deny my kid's request? She looks over the entitled dad's shoulder and sees the kid standing there. She makes an expression of shock. Sister, you use the argument that only older than 18 can use these. Now you want me to just give it to your kid, who obviously looks like she's seven? 
Like you are older than 18. You look 16 tops. Just give me the fireworks. He then proceeds to push her out of his way before she can say something and try to grab a firework on top of our car. I slap his hand before he can reach one. He backed down in disbelief. His face had the most confused expression I've ever seen. It's like he couldn't process the fact that someone dared lay a hand on his precious skin. What the heck? Did you just hit my hand? You should show your elders some respect. I never gave you the right to do that. Me. And we never gave you the right to steal our fireworks, you jerk. He seemed more shocked than before. He opens his hand in the air like he was going to slap me. Before he could even try, my sister punched him in the nose. Sister, don't you dare lay a finger on my brother, you jerk. The entitled kid started screaming so loudly my ears hurt. My dad and stepmom saw the commotion and came rushing towards us. My dad, hey, 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 what the heck is going on here? These two brats were launching fireworks. It's dangerous. I try to warn them, but she punched me in the face. He said while holding his nose and trying to calm Entitled Kid down. Entitled Kid, I want it, I want it. He was desperately shouting while rolling on the floor. My dad, first of all, she's 20. Second of all, OP wasn't launching crap because I forbade him to. What happened? He said, looking at my sister this time. Sister, this guy just randomly appeared and tried to take our fireworks so that his kid could launch them. When OP tried to stop him by slapping his hand, Entitled Dad was going to slap OP, but I punched him first. Entitled Dad. Lies! She assaulted me. She and that spawn there. Their kids trying to rob my fireworks. Oh, now the fireworks are his, huh? Stepmom. What? We bought those with our money. Man, you're full of crap. The Entitled Dad became pale. He was cornered now. My dad. Hey, Entitled Kid. Why are you crying? Entitled Kid stopped his tantrum for a while and said... Daddy said I could hold the fireworks, he said while crossing his arms and frowning. My dad, well, would you look at that? I'm going to ask you to leave or I will call the cops. Entitled dad, who the heck are you to talk to me like that? You think you have authority here? You made my kid cry. My cop cousin will hear about this. I'll throw all of you in jail. Do you have any idea who I am? My dad, well, do you have any idea who I am? No, I'm the birthday girl's uncle. So I guess I have authority, and if you don't leave right now, I will drag you through the gate. Leave. Now. Entitled Dad opened his mouth to say something, but gave up. He grabbed his kid who was still crying, and signaled to a lady in the entrance of the saloon to go with him. I suppose it was his mom. They left, and the party continued normally until the end of the night. We still talk about it to this day, and just laugh our butts off. You represent this school wherever you go. Before I start... I used to work at a preschool that was at a church. I had a horrible time there and was only there for four months. I ended up quitting because of my health, but this story played a part in it. I had just gotten off work and it was still pretty early. I had gotten off around 2.30 that afternoon and decided to run to Target, the closest store was Target, and get some cat food. I was wearing my work shirt, which was the unforgettable Target Red, but this had big white letters proclaiming St. Something Catholic School. It took me a while to get to the cat food because I'm not familiar with the layout of this target. I finally get to the cat food, see the food my kit needs, and I'm just about to leave when I spot Karen in all of her glory with her cart loaded with groceries. I shoot past, and she looked at me and grabbed my arm. She looked me up and down, and I guess she failed to notice the big white letters and only saw red and said, Can you get the dog food for me? I'm in a hurry. Me. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm in a hurry myself. I have to go and get my dog from the groomers. A total lie since she was getting groomed next week, but usually this works. But I saw you get the cat food. Me. Yeah, I have a kitten at home, but I have to pick up my dog. But you work here. You have food. Me. Look, if you read my shirt, you would see that I don't work here. I show her the shirt, and I hope it makes a connection with her. Nope. You work at a church which means you have to help me. Me, growing tired. Ma'am, I have to leave. I would like to go and get my dog and feed my cat. Goodbye. But right before I leave, I hear her say, I will speak to your boss about this. I leave, thinking nothing of it. Though part of me was worried that she would call my boss 
who we shall call Joe, because she was one of those people who believed we represented the school no matter what we did off the clock. The next day I go in at 7 as usual, but as I walk in, I hear Joe call my name. Joe, hey Maggie, come in for just a second. I walk in feeling my nerves start to wake up. I know just what is about to happen. I walk in and see Karen, though I don't really pay attention to Karen as much as the fact of who she was. Now that I see, I know she's not a parent since the preschool is pretty small with only 20 to 30 kids. I know most of the parents' names and faces and I know for certain that Karen was not a parent or even a grandparent that came sometimes. Maybe she was a church member, I don't know. Joe is sitting at the desk and I see Karen sitting in one of the seats. Joe, thank you for coming to see me, Miss Karen. Now I understand you met Maggie last night at the store. Karen, yes I did. She was rude and refused to help me. Joe turned to me next. Maggie, is this true? Did you refuse to help her? Me. Joe, this happened after I got off. I had to go home to get my dog from the groomers. I hated lying to my boss. I heard Karen scoff at this. Joe. Now, Miss Karen, I am not responsible for my workers for what they do when they are not on campus, but we do have a motto. Here at St. Something, it's Matthew 5.16. In the same way that your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your father who is in heaven. Do you understand, Miss Karen? We encourage our teachers and students to be the hands and feet of God. This being said, I do believe that Maggie should have helped you. She does represent our school. As Joe was saying this, I was dumbfounded. How could Joe agree with this lady? Karen smiles at Joe. Joe. Maggie, this is a warning. If I hear of anything like this again, you will be written up and let go. Do you understand? I nod as if I was in the twilight zone. I kept thinking, can you really be fired for what you do off the clock? Is this even legal? Karen smiled, got up with a crap-eating grin, and walked out the door. I look up at Joe. Me. Joe, were you just saying that to make her happy? Am I really in trouble? Joe. Well, part of it, yes. I do expect the teachers to set an example for others. What you did was very unlike Christ. You should have helped her. Me. Really? Yes, really. Now go to your class. And that was the end of that. I got so mad for the rest of the day, I could barely stand the kids. So yeah, this is one of the reasons why I left. One of the many reasons. If this happened to you, would you keep working at the school or would you quit? Karen tried to get me fired by claiming I charged her for more than she was supposed to pay. Okay, so this was a while ago, back when I worked at a water park. It was a very hot day and I'm working at the tube stand. My job is to sit at my station behind a cash register and ring up people for rentable inflatable tubes that they can use for the day. We have both double tubes, which is a figure eight looking inflatable tube with holes in the center that you can put your legs through. And we have single tubes, which is just a donut shaped tube. Fast forward a few hours, we had sold out of all of our double tubes and only had a few single tubes left and my shift was almost over. I'm sitting there minding my own business and then a mom and her two kids come up to the stand. Entitled mom, hi, could I get two double tubes? Me, sorry ma'am, we've sold out of all of the doubles a while ago. I can rent you out the last singles we have though. She just looked shocked, like I had just insulted her two kids who might I add were burning their feet on the hot concrete. I tell them to stand in the shade next to me, which they do. What? No, I need the double tubes. My two kids want to share one and I want to ride one with my husband. Now, I had already dealt with crappy customers before her, so I was already kind of in a bad mood. Me, listen, I physically can't give you double tubes when we don't have any. Well, I don't care. I know you have some double tubes left. Me. I can show you the back if you want. That'll prove it to you. No, I want my double tubes. She pulls out her membership card and she's a diamond elite. It's a high tier for members of this park. See, I am a diamond member and I need my tubes. Me, sorry, but I can't get you these tubes. Fine, give me the singles, but only charge me for two doubles. Usually I'm not allowed to do this. I only did it to customers that I liked and I certainly did not like this lady. Me. Sorry ma'am, I can't do that for you. I'll get fired. Well, why does it matter? It's basically the same thing. I'm not doing that, I say as I ring her up. Ugh, fine, 
whatever. I ring her up and I finally think it's over. Oh boy, was I wrong. Now, where I am stationed, guest services is to the left of me. This lady legit goes to guest services and starts yelling about how I charged her for four doubles instead of four singles. I am absolutely shocked at this lady. A supervisor comes up to me and says, did you charge her for four doubles instead of four singles? Me. No, I did not. She was complaining about not being able to get two double tubes, so she bought four singles. Entitled Mom is behind the supervisor as she's speaking to me, and she has the most crap-eating grin on her face you can imagine. Me. Look, I'll pull up her receipt for you. I press some buttons on the monitor, and her receipt pulls up, saying she bought four singles. Supervisor. Alright, sorry for this. She goes up to Entitled Mom and says that she paid for the four singles and not four doubles. Entitled Mom just gets so furious and starts yelling about how I didn't give her the Diamond Elite discount. Ironically, if she would have used her Diamond Elite discount, she would have gotten four singles for almost the same price as two doubles. The supervisor tells her that she should have thought of that before she purchased the tubes. Entitled Mom is defeated and leaves, and I get to go home. What a lovely day. Don't tell people how to do their job if you're an idiot. So backstory, I used to work at a factory who suffered severely under a director who wanted to make more money with little idea as to how to run a factory or how to see through people trying to BS you to gain favor. One person in particular was notorious for sucking up. When I started, he was the boss for about a third of the production unit and as it happened, he was also the guy who took over whenever my own boss needed time off, was out liaising with other companies or otherwise wasn't on company grounds. This guy had a massive superiority complex and couldn't handle being wrong or having made a mistake. And just to make it better, he was also clueless about quite a lot of things outside of the machine shop where he was the boss. Safe to say, my partner and I really disliked him and made an active effort to work against his stupidity whenever he was our acting boss. So as for the story itself, my partner and I made up the company's goods reception and quality control department. Basically, our job was to receive the goods and inspect that everything was in order, correct amount had been delivered, no transport or production damage or mistakes, and then prepare the things for storage. But as you might expect, sometimes things weren't quite in order. Some things were unimportant and we just ignored them. Most things we send in to get them repaired, since most mistakes were fixable, and then send a bill to the contractor who were hired for the job and a few things we discarded because they were broken beyond what we could repair. And this particular idiot was allowed to green light things that my partner and I had sent in to get repaired. So one day the director comes out with the head of productions behind him, wanting to know why a particular type of good from a particular contractor always gets sent in for repair. And I do mean every time. And we explain that because Purchase opted to use the cheapest place to get things done, he wasn't happy with that explanation and wanted to get someone who knew of such things to have a look at it. Cue Mr. Idiot himself, who takes one look at them and goes, Oh, those? Those are perfect. Right as they're supposed to be. And director tells us to just send them on their way. My partner, a fairly temperamental guy, was furious, but we made a plan. And so Idiot and director left, but head of production stayed behind. With every piece of good we received, we had pulled the schematics in order to measure if everything was in order or not. And then on this schematic, we had write some additional information, purchase number, steel certificate, etc. So that we could easily trace everything back should there be a problem. And for this particular thing, we drew an arrow to the part that was done incorrectly, wrote what the problem was and approved by Mr. Idiot and asked the production manager to sign it. And off the goods went. Five minutes later, we got a call from storage so, what's the deal with these goods? Why aren't they in the machine shop? Well, because Mr. Idiot said they're okay and the director is backing him up. We then briefed him on the plan and he was somewhat happy. So about two weeks later, our trap sprung. Our assembly unit, whom I'd already spoken to, needed these particular parts and they received the ones that weren't made correctly. So they of course contacted their boss, who, according to plan, didn't contact my boss since he was away but the director himself, about how quality control had really messed up. Of course, the director came flying over, howling and screaming about our incompetence, to which my partner and I calmly asked him, so, it's about those specific parts, creating this particular problem? Well, yes, you morons. The director then called for Mr. Idiot to come and straighten us out. 
Mr. Idiot stood there, all smug, expecting his next big promotion, but we called storage and asked our storage worker to bring up the pallet with the remaining goods and the schematic that had a very neatly, approved by Mr. Idiot, signed production manager, written on it. The half of a second it took him to realize that these goods that risked delaying the shipment and thus costing a small fortune in delays had been green-lighted by him was priceless. His face went from, oh yeah, I'm securing my seat as the next production manager, to, oh crap, I'm gonna get fired for this. He was later told to stay right away from the quality control department, and my partner and I, as well as our boss, celebrated with cake. I'm a landscaper, not a construction worker. A bit of background. Before the fire department, I started working at a landscaping company, which I still work with to this day. Mind that our uniforms consisted of khaki pants and a bright green shirt with our company logo on the back. I was outside of an alternate office location waiting for my boss to arrive since I had gotten there rather early. Right around the corner, there was construction going on. Our uniforms are a bit similar in terms of the shirts, minus the logo, and a hard hat since we were going to be working near the construction. Safety regulations and that jazz. This hard hat also had our company logo on it. As I was waiting for my boss to arrive, I would assume the person who was the manager of the construction approached me from behind. I didn't notice him as I was on my phone and didn't hear his footsteps. He taps me on the shoulder to get my attention. As I turned to face him, he had the most arrogant, crud-eating grin I'd ever seen. I'm guessing this was due to the fact that he thought he had caught a worker slacking off and could exercise his authority. Dialogue proceeded like this. Jerk. Why aren't you working? Where's your boss? Me. Excuse me? I said where's your boss? Shouldn't you be working? Me. I'm waiting for my boss to get here. And he should already be here, right? Go ahead and get that stack of bricks for me. This way. He motions to a pile of bricks in the corner. At this point, I wondered what was going on and figured it out pretty quickly. Oh, alright. You think I'm with the construction guys around the corner? Sorry man, I'm not with them. What are you talking about? I saw you here yesterday. Yes, I was here yesterday, but not with construction. Yes, but you were here, I saw you. Sir, I'm with the landscaping company that takes care of trash cleanup and mowing the grass, as well as taking care of the flower beds and mulch. He looks at me like I'm crazy, until I show him the large, bold company logo on the back of my shirt where he approached me from. He then appears to have just seen a ghost, turns around, and leaves me alone. The End The McDonald's Screeching Lady I typically bring my lunch to work. However, on occasion, I will go to the nearby McDonald's. This probably happens about once a month or so. It was a weekday and I was eating in the seating area. I was wearing my uniform, which is a black blouse and black slacks, but I had taken off my name tag for my break. I had my coat and my purse with me in the booth beside me, but I will give the entitled lady a benefit by saying she probably didn't notice it. As I was eating, the actual manager came over to my table. She had to teach a new hire how to make an ice cream cone, so she was giving it to me as no one had ordered one. Don't blame them, this was December. But free ice cream, so I accepted. Side note, I do know the manager from a previous encounter where I had to call 911 for an elderly lady in medical distress. I had to write out my version of events in a report for the manager, as I guess she had to report it to the head office. I wasn't surprised when she approached me, because we do tend to say hello to one another when I go there. So I'm seated, eating, when an entitled lady approaches me. I work in customer service and immediately can tell that this lady is upset. Unfortunately, I was still in work mode, so I didn't immediately tell her to buzz off. Basically, the lady started to complain about the wait time for her food and that her son wasn't happy with his burger. I smiled, said it's lunch hour, so you probably should expect a wait time. The lady's son was not with her. I have no idea what his complaint actually was. The lady said I should hire more people so the lunch wait isn't so long. I realized she isn't just complaining to me randomly, and I told her I don't work here. This is when she said I clearly work here, as I'm in uniform and the worker was just talking to me. Still polite, I laughed a little, and simply said I do know the manager, but I don't work here. She stormed off in a huff and I went back to eating, thinking that was that. Nope. I then hear her screeching from the counter area. I couldn't see her, but I could hear her berating the workers for ignoring her, then yell about how the manager was lazy and she demanded a corporate number. Something else must have happened because it was quiet when I packed up my things to leave. The entitled lady was still there, fuming, while the actual manager was talking to her calmly. I wish I could say the lady was kicked out of the store, 
but I left to return to work and prayed she didn't come over to my store, where I would actually need to deal with her. She didn't come over, and I hope I never see her again. My son wants to go in your wheelchair. Get out so he can try it. I've been browsing this sub for a while and never thought I would post on here. Oh, how I was wrong. Backstory. I'm a 29-year-old female and have been confined to a wheelchair since I was 17. I'm a quadriplegic and can use a manual wheelchair at home but use a power wheelchair in public for practical reasons. I have mostly full use of my upper body and partial use of my lower body. I've been mistaken for a paraplegic a few times. This happened about a month ago. I was downtown shopping when I heard a deafening squeal of a kid who was about 12, entitled kid. Oh, that's a cool scooter. How fast does it go? Me. Thanks, little man. Yeah, it goes pretty fast. Can I have a go? Me. Thinking he meant to sit in my lap and I drive him around, which in any other scenario I would have been happy to do, but not with everything going on right now. Sorry, dude, but not today. The kid says, Aw, okay, and stomps away, and I thought that was the end of it, but you know, I wouldn't be here if it was. A few minutes later, I hear the ground start to tremble as the Megatron Karen approaches. Oh boy, I thought, this is going to be fun. Entitled Parent Excuse me, what did you say to my son? Me, confused. Uh, he wanted a ride in my wheelchair. I said no. What did you just say to me? You need to respect your elders and not talk down to my poor little angel. You don't even need that wheelchair. I know your legs work. You're just faking it to get attention. Now let my son have a ride. She couldn't have been much older than 35, so obviously not my elder. But even if my nan spoke to me like that, I wouldn't reply kindly. Me. All of my patients officially gone. My wheelchair cost more than your car, and you want me to miraculously heal out of my chair? So your dirty little goblin can take a joyride? Okay. Goblin was smirking at me the entire time. Here's where the story gets graphic. I have hypermobility, which makes my joints extremely flexible and dislocation easy and relatively painless. I also have titanium screws inside my neck that creak loudly when I move a certain way. Bring on the Frankenstein. I lean forward, push down my right arm, dislocating my shoulder blade with a loud pop as I twisted my neck to make it creak then pushed down with my left hand to contort my arm and hand into an unnatural position. This all happened in a few seconds, but it was enough to make Karen, red-faced and horrified, scream out, STOP! It's okay, entitled kid, let's go! And they hurried out of the store. I could hear laughter coming from behind me as a friend who works there walked up to me and said, That was mean. He knew me well and had seen me pull that trick before. Needless to say, I never had an issue like that again. It's a small town and news travels fast. Don't mess with the girl in the wheelchair. Entitled Aunt locks our house because she wants to sell it. So people really wanted to know the other story about my aunt. So backstory for those who haven't read the last one. I lived in my grandparents' house for 10 years. Both grandparents are passed and there is no will so not sure what to do with the house. But grandma's wish before passing was not to sell the house. About my aunt, she's married to her husband who has his business abroad and has one boy of my age. He's a really sweet kid and I love him, but she sent him to a boarding school for character development. So now, over to the actual story. Now when we were in the house, we had everything bad happen to us. We lost money, my dad got his leg hurt under a bus, he also had cancer, I got depression and anxiety, my dad lost his job, etc, etc. So basically, a bad omen. We moved about a year ago, and I kid you not, our life instantly became perfect, like amazing. See, the only reason we had to make trips back and forth in that house was because our old house was 220 square yards and our current home is 110 square yards, so we couldn't fit all of our furniture in it. So my grandma passed a few weeks ago and after her passing, my aunt, who is very hungry for money, has been trying to get my other psycho aunt convinced to sell the house, but they won't have a home after that, so she denies. Now. That lady at least wants to sell our floor. The house has great value, so she really wants to get the money from it. Her husband returned from Thailand, where he lives, to attend the Chautha, something done to pay final respects to someone. Now, we didn't go home, so we have no idea what the heck went on there, but my psycho aunt, who was kind of concerned, told us that the aunt came with her husband and he put locks on our house, 
hence stopping us from doing anything in it. We had to get new stuff for our new home that we're going to move to in May and wanted to keep those things in that house because we have no space where we're living. Now, my aunt told my mom about this when we went there to accept the delivery, but mom and dad went to a locked house. She was restricting us from getting our personal property. There are books, tables, cabinets, almiras, and whatnot in that house. We can't get any of it now, just because that jerk thinks she's entitled to that house and our stuff. My mom's relatives, except for my grandma and grandpa, don't like my dad for some reason. It's a long story. Now let me tell you what. My dad is the sweetest human being I know. He's there to protect us. He handles whatever insults my mom's relatives throw at him. He works really hard for us. He gives us every luxury, even in dire times and whatnot. I don't know why they don't like him. He's such a nice man. I literally had to protect him at my grandma's funeral so that no one would say anything to him and I was ready to fight if anyone did. Anyway, my dad didn't get angry or anything but simply said this. When we'll be able to move out, we'll take everything and never come back ever again. Everyone agreed. Now, we had totally let this go because we know how crazy of a person that entitled lady and her husband are. But about a week ago, my mom received a call. My friend usually called at the time, so I thought it would be her, but it was the aunt. She had been drinking and was saying some senseless things. Here's how the conversation went. Aunt, I have filed a police report against you and you will get arrested if you try to break the locks. Me, that doesn't make any sense. We have just as much a right as you do over that house. Aunt, you and your husband will not come near that house and stop telling Aunt two crazy stories about not selling. Me, realizing she thinks I'm my mom. We're not saying anything to her. You're insane. And your husband. I will make him pay and he will suffer. At this point, I have had enough and just want to make her shut up. I have no respect for her now and I just went off. I have never ever said anything bad to her before, but yeah. Me. Okay, now I can't take it. If you ever call here again, you will face consequences. You are no longer welcome to call here and I will straight up block you. So here's the thing. My sister is the kind of person who has had to shut this woman up a lot of times, so she thought I was her. My sister is 23. She calls me by my sister's name. You jerk. Give the phone to your mom. This instant. She is my sister and I have a right to talk to her. Me. I'm OP. You just swore at a kid. Aunt starts stuttering. No, you're lying. You can't be OP. I know it's not. So she has a very sensitive ego and the thought of being told off by a kid just broke her. Me. It is me. And now don't ever call us again, you idiot. Bye. I disconnected the call and blocked her. I don't know what scene will be created once we break the locks, but my mom and dad were proud of me for what I did. The fact that I was the one who said all of this broke her completely. Dad was really angry that she swore at me and said I did good by not stooping to her level. Also, I was talking in front of my mom and even though she knows I swear, she's never heard me do it and I don't want to scar her. Entitled parents think they own the ski lift at a major resort. Long ago, when I was but a wee lad, so like a couple of months ago, I was skiing with a friend at a resort quite close to my home in the vastness of the universe. But that is besides the point of this story, so I will dive right into it. My friend and I had decided to take a break from our studies at our university and go on a pleasant ski trip. What fun! We had skied most of the day with fair weather, fresh snow, and a few lift lines. Unfortunately, there is one lift that is cursed. For lines plague this lift each and every hour of the 8-hour ski day. The dreaded T-bar. The terror of the beginner skier. Anyways, we pizza stopped our way to the back of the line and waited our turn like any pair of gentlemen would. During this wait, I glanced at the sign in the queue ahead and noticed it said alternate in very large red letters. This sign is of great importance to the story, so please take note. Anyways, as we wait, a group of three, a large man in a blue 80s style ski jacket with the most appalling yellow boots, a woman with three braids of hair sticking from the back of her studded motorcycle helmet, and a kid who appeared quite young and seemingly unready to partake in the conquest known as the T-Bar comes skiing down the slope. This strange group approached from our left, nonchalantly ducked under the rope indicating the formation of the line, literally pushed my friend backwards and took place directly in front of us as a group of three. Now, I'm not sure how much any of you dear readers know of T-Bars, but they can only seat two. 
So my friend and I are perplexed over this turn of event, and I grew more and more frustrated as we progress. So, to alleviate my growing anger, I say, Excuse me, I believe you cut in line. The back is near the back. As if the back could not be any clearer. 80s daredevil wannabe dad. Shut up! Heavily accented with a deep southern twang. My friend, how about you shut up and wait your turn? The group did not reply, but the entitled leather-clad mother looked back at us and gave us the mitten. By that, we think she may have been trying to give us a mean gesture, but found it difficult to do so in mittens. We progressed. My friend and I are talking very loudly about entitled people and amateur skiers, blah blah blah. Then it came time to alternate with the line next to us. Two lines filled with people become one, each line switching off. So naturally, the entitled gang skis right over the skis of the woman whose turn it was and off into the blue. Now singular line. This woman, who we will call Marjorie, because that's a dope name and she was a dope lady, tells them off and the crusty 80s macho man gives his classic response. Marjorie turns to us and asks, Are they in ski school? They must be. Ski schoolers have a special line to bypass standard crowds, but only under direct supervision of a ski instructor. Me. They must be. However, they probably just paid more for their lift tickets than we did. They didn't. We all pay the same amount. Marjorie laughs and we proceed to have a nice conversation about how idiotic the people in front of us are, very loudly. Perhaps to the extent of overreaction, but hey, we were having fun. Their turn gets here, but wait, you can't have three people on a single bar, so the dad scoops his kid up and holds him. This is a no-no. The lift operators stop the lift and ask that they separate accordingly. So Miss Triple Braid Mom scoots back so she can take the following bar up the mountain alone. The operators turn the lift back on, and the bar swoops in and is placed on the kid's lower back. Now, this bar is perfectly leveled for the kid, but it barely comes to the father's mid-thighs. So not only is he stooped over like a gorilla, but he is now terribly off balance. The woman catches our bar just fine and seems comfortable, but as the hunchback of Mississippi, aka the yellow-booted cookie monster, is carried up the mountain, his position looks more and more precarious. It is worth mentioning, at this point my friend and I are securely holding onto the bar and being carried up the mountain behind Marjorie and her companion. So the fall. This is wonderfully terrible in so many ways. I will try my best to explain this in perfect detail. The father compensates for the bar by hunching forward, meaning his center of mass is forward. The ski's binding can only hold so much weight. Crack! The binding released the boots, as any safe binding should, and the man falls on his face into the snow. His feet swipe up into the air. Some of you may know this fall to be called a scorpion, and his skis slide backwards down the slope, parallel for some time, before careening off into the adjacent slopes. The mother, in a desperate attempt to avoid her face-planted partner, swerves rightward and ends up with her skis stuck in a rut. She immediately loses balance and tumbles to the side, still holding onto the bar. Her husband, who is now sliding downward, grabs her by the leg as she passes to the right. She holds for a second or two until she too falls and now the two of them are sliding downward towards Marjorie who gives out a resounding, for heaven's sake, as her and her companion tumble over the pair of line cutters. My friend and I decide to get off here to avoid the calamity ahead. From the sidelines we watch as the mess of people grows larger and larger as people look for lost skis, lost poles, and lost dignities. From here, my friend and I leave but not before I noticed the one person who made it through this gargantuan-sized mess, the kid of the entitled parents, casually being pulled up the slope, glancing backward at the mess their parents had caused. I don't work here. I don't even live in this state. I'll be referring to my grandmother in the German term for grandmother, which is Oma. Now this happened some years ago when I had just turned 15. My Oma invited me to Colorado to visit her for a while, and I was all for that since I didn't see her too often. A couple days into my stay, we went to buy some groceries. As my Oma was at the other end of the aisle, I was given permission to look for some cereal I might like. That was when I heard someone to the side of me ask for some help. Now, I am pretty shy and usually try to avoid contact with people, but when someone needs help, I gladly jump in to assist them. Excuse me, little miss. Would you mind helping me grab this bag of cereal? I can't reach it. A little old lady got my attention. Sure, no problem. Now, I'm not considered amazingly tall, I'm just above average at 5 foot 5, but this lady was barely 5 feet. Just to reach the bag of cereal, I had to stand on my tiptoes and reach for it, but I managed to get it down and helped her put it in her cart. 
Thank you very much, young lady. God bless you, she said. It wasn't an issue. Do you need help with anything else? No, thank you. My son is actually shopping with me, but he had to run out to the car to get his wallet. Okay then, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. I wave her off before turning around to go back to my Oma, who was still trying to make a decision whether to buy one thing or the other. It's been a while, so I can't remember exactly what she held in her hands. Then suddenly, a rough tap on my shoulder prompted me to turn back around. My eyes met with this middle-aged lady who was wearing workout gear. She shall be named Karen, as it is only right in this sub. Excuse me, do you know where the ice cream section is? Karen said. Seeing as I've only been following my Oma around and not paying attention, I could only respond, Um, I can't think of where it is. I haven't been here before. Oh, you're a new worker? Shouldn't you be accompanied by another person before helping people? She seemed curious. Realizing what Karen is thinking, I say, Oh no, I don't work here. You helped that old lady before. You can't lie. I saw it with my own eyes. She couldn't reach the cereal, so she asked me, since I'm taller. So you admit it. She let out an accomplished smile. I don't even know why she was satisfied with my answer. It wasn't like she really achieved anything. I did help her, but I'm not wearing a uniform. I was wearing a neon pink shirt with a cat on the front. Don't think that's uniform for any grocery store. You should ask yourself that. Why aren't you in uniform? Karen screamed at me. I don't have a uniform. I don't work here. After yelling that, I tried to walk away, but she stepped in front of me and bumped me back a bit. Is there a problem? My Oma strolled over due to my yelling. Stay out of this. I'm trying to get this idiot here to help me find the ice cream aisle. Now for some background about my Oma. She's an older lady who used to be in the Air Force and she's not afraid to speak her mind. She could be pretty intimidating due to the fact that she's over six feet tall. Did you just call my granddaughter an idiot? What gives you the right to talk to her that way? She seethed. She's impersonating a staff member. She is the one in the wrong. Karen went to grab me, but my Oma put her arm out in front of me. Are you joking or just foolish? Look at her. Where's her name tag? She's not even dressed in the right color for the uniform. My Oma didn't hold back her words. Like I was trying to tell you, I just helped the old lady get something that was too far out of her reach. I don't work here. I don't even live in this state. I'm just here to visit my grandmother. I gestured to my Oma. But, she said as she tried to reach around my Oma, attempting to make another grab at me. But a pretty big guy with huge muscles pushed his way in front of the lady and cut her off. Lady, leave the kid alone. If you put your hands on her, I will have no issues with arresting you. He said as he pulled out a badge, signifying he was a police officer. Her face turned white before she tried to defend herself. She was... Nope, don't say a word. Just walk away. It's not... She tried to speak again. Ma'am, I won't say it again. Stop fighting with me and leave her alone. He said with a stern voice, making Karen turn and walk away with her cart. After she left, we thanked the man, and as he was about to reply, a familiar voice called out. What's taking so long? Did you find the oatmeal I forgot? The nice old lady said as she rounded the corner. Well, hello again, young lady, she said with a pleasantly surprised smile on her face. Hello, ma'am. Sorry, mom. Some lady was pestering this girl. Didn't even know she was the one who helped you while I was away. He responded before turning to me. Thank you for helping my mother. I told her to wait for me to get back, but she is a little bit stubborn. Nice old lady playfully slapped him on the arm, making us laugh a bit. After that, we chatted with the two of them for a bit and explained to nice old lady what had just happened before saying our goodbyes. Funnily enough, we later went to the ice cream aisle without Karen in sight. Never had as much satisfaction eating ice cream as I did reminiscing about Karen's face when the man showed his badge. Male Karen's Low Salt Sermon to the Wrong Congregation I'm a DSD vendor, meaning I stock a specific brand of product only without working for the place I'm actually stocking it. Name brands of beer, bread, snack cakes, chips, sodas, snack crackers, some cookies, some frozen pizzas, and more are stocked by DSD vendors and typically wear uniforms branded as such. I get mistaken a lot for someone who works at any of my route stops. Most of them are just oopsie mistakes and they move on, no biggie. Some people, however, seem to perceive this information as irrelevant. The cast today is just me and what appears to be a thinner, off-duty Carl Winslow with his entourage of the A-man section, who looks like the types who would say, Honey child, regularly. Please do not interpret my recollection of his accent as critical. I genuinely love his particular way of speaking and wanted to try to capture it. 
plus, I wanted the people who read these aloud on YouTube to try to pronounce it as such, for giggles. Act 1. So I was stocking my usual product, when the man rounds the corner like he's in a hurry, and without missing a beat, asks me bluntly, Tell me where that Kool-Aid! Me, pausing to think a second. I think it's on this aisle, actually. Okay, now tell me where that flour. Me, flour? Like for baking? That I'm not sure, as I'm not usually with the store. I don't really know where other stuff is much. He just breezes on past, and I resume my usual thing, thinking this may be one of the many ordinary encounters. He hunts down his druthers and disappears to aisles unknown, and I go back to get more stuff to stock. I see a gaggle of more finely adorned ladies turn another corner, who I later discover are with him. They nod at me and shop casually down a different aisle. Act 2 I come back down the main aisle with more stuff to stock, and he rounds the corner of the other aisle they were on and asks them if they found any low salt stuff, which that aisle is known pretty well for being high salt in general. The man looking over to me, Tell me where that is low salt. Me, low salt? What in particular? Of this stuff? Yeah, or anything of that low salt. We look around for a minute on that other aisle, just trying to help the guy out, despite me being totally unfamiliar with that section. Me, I think the masses have beat you to the low salt kinds of items. Looks like they're sold out. You gotta have some of them low salt summer, right? Huh? We keep looking, and all of the low salt options are sold out. Tons of the high salt plain types, though. My doctor done told me gotta have low salt now. Gotta go them low sodium now. You hear me? I understand, but looks like it's sold out. There's low fat in some cases, but it doesn't say anything about salt. If you ask me, you should just avoid this whole aisle, or just any snacks in general if you're on a low salt diet. All of this and that kind of stuff is basically high sodium. You still gotta stock me some of them low salt. Doctor say I gotta do that low salt, and I can't find none of them low salt. You gotta tell the store. They gotta put them out low salt, you hear me? Me. I'm not with the store, like I said before. I'm with the vendor, and I don't have any say in what gets ordered, and they wouldn't really listen to me anyway, considering I don't work here. If you want my expert medical opinion from the School of Groceries, I suggest you not even bother with this aisle at all. Entourage, muttering in agreement with me. Hmm, honey, it look like they out of them low salt. We best get a move on. He ain't even with the stove. Didn't you hear? He ain't gonna know what salt is which kind. He ain't no dietitian. He with the vendor. I mouth, thank you, and nod to the ladies, and they nod back quietly, with eye rolls and laugh a little. The man grabs a few low-fat things and holds one of them up, showing me the back of it, pointing at the nutrition facts, which says 11% sodium per serving. Me. Sir, I don't know whether that's good or bad. I don't know if 11% is high or low, for a long list of reasons. That don't look like a low salt to me. You need to tell them store. They gotta order more than low salt. I gotta eat now, you hear me? Me. Sir, the stuff on this aisle is all junk food. You ain't gotta have none of this. <laughs> you ain't gotta have none of this stuff. He and his entourage walk off, and I don't hear anything back from them, and I take my stock elsewhere and put it out. At least I came away from it with a fun story to share that didn't get too heated, despite his apparent disregard for any facts anyone could offer him. It's a wonder that doctor managed to convince him to change his diet to begin with. Don't break the rules, and then insist your staff enforce them. Whilst I was at university, I worked in our students' hall, basically a two-story bar that was subsidized by the government. Because of the subsidy, it was the cheapest place in town, so we would get a couple locals come in. To prevent this, we were supposed to check everyone that had a student ID, but no one minded as the locals were usually polite and handled their booze better than most students. My manager, who was a local himself, would encourage locals to come and would either discourage ID checks or simply not inform new staff of the situation. He would often steal from the bar and would give free drinks to his mates. One night, he had a bunch of his buddies in town come in having a drinking session at the bar's expense, paid for maybe one-fifth of the drinks, till way past closing and beyond our license. This resulted in the police being called for a noise complaint and his boss, Hall's head, finding out. To cover his butt, he claimed that the groups were locals that we, the bar staff, had happily allowed to stay, and then fudged the accounting for the night to make up for the free drinks. Because of this, he himself demanded we check every student ID and the head took away some of our employee perks. 
The Sunday after this all went down, the pool tournament guys come in. These guys rotate which bar they go to every week between a list of maybe six that have enough pool tables and lounge space. I personally had served them a half dozen times. They make their way over to the bar and the first guy is well in his 40s. Me. Hey man, before I can serve you, I have to see your student ID. He chuckled and said something along the lines of, Do I look like a student? And proceeded to order. Me. Look, I'm sorry, but I've been told that if you haven't got a student ID, I can't serve you. He started to realize I wasn't just messing with him and looked at the other member of staff who reiterated the point. Him. Are you serious? We've been coming here for two years. Me. Yeah, sorry. Manager is cracking down on the only student's rule. I can grab my supervisor for you if you want. My supervisor was also a student and explained the situation. Said he was sorry for the inconvenience and that if they had any complaints to call the head, my manager's boss, and even gave out a couple of his cards that were in his office. The pool guys left, which meant no one was really in the building, so we ended up closing early. Next morning, I awoke to my manager screaming down the phone at me, but it was my day off, so I hung up and didn't go to work as a customer till past noon. When I did, my coworkers couldn't wait to tell me what had happened. My manager had come in and had a shouting match with my supervisor in front of everyone grabbing a morning coffee. The head had indeed received some complaints and scheduled a meeting with the manager that morning. Not wanting to face it alone, he took my supervisor with him. I imagine intending to throw him under the bus as much as possible. The head was upset. A. Because all these 40-something men had called to complain on his personal number on a Sunday. B. Because these 40-something men, by their own admission, had been coming here for years at the invite of the manager whom they knew well. My manager tried to save face and claim they were associated with the university, that they were in fact lectures, that it was the bar staff's failing to check for student ID all the time, and then turned on my supervisor saying he had given them a bad reputation, cost them money by turning them away, and closing early as well as laying bare every other mistake he had ever made. My supervisor explained that it was never explained to staff that customers had to be students, as the manager actively encouraged locals to come in, that even lectures get a form of student ID and explained to the head about the manager's drinking with his mates and the dodgy accounting he'd do. This led to the CCTV being checked. When the head saw that it was in fact the manager and his mates, that the bar staff rarely put anything through the tills at his request, suspended him on the spot. He then said the accounts would need to be audited and that he would likely be terminated and even prosecuted. After a surreal couple of weeks, we got our perks back. They hired a new manager and eventually they installed locks on the doors that could only be opened with a student ID. No idea what happened to the old manager, but by no means a loss. Entitled mom tried to sue my grandma for her house. My grandma had four kids, all were girls. My mom is one of the four and Entitled mom's mom was also one of the four. My grandpa passed and left everything to my grandma. My grandma has a will that divides everything equally to each of her kids my three aunts and my mom. Entitled mom's mom, my aunt, passed away. Entitled mom has four younger siblings and she's the eldest, and my aunt's inheritance it included my grandma's current house. Entitled mom and my grandma both live together. Entitled mom is a horrible person. She drinks too much and goes out partying until 4 a.m. She has nowhere to live, so she ended up with my grandma. My grandma takes care of her kid as entitled mom goes out partying. Entitled mom spoils her kid using family money, as in, she asks everyone to get stuff for the kid and has successfully managed to get this kid seven backpacks, three luggage cases full of clothing, which fits a whole closet in the house in the guest room, and this kid has managed to break four iPads slash tablets, all paid for by my mom. On top of that, Entitled mom is severely obese. I don't know how these guys are so obsessed with her. Normally I wouldn't judge, but she has a kid that she never takes care of properly. She has managed to also get money from different family members for surgeries, including tummy tucks and liposuction. She loses all this weight, pretends to be better, then reverts back to her bad behavior. So with all of that out of the way, let me get into what she was doing. She went to the courts, suing my grandma. More recently, she claimed that my grandma was senile. My grandma is old, but her memory is not fading. She does not have any diagnosed dementia of any sort. The only thing she has is bad hearing. Now, my grandma was upset by getting sued, but she is very family-oriented 
and continued to let Entitled Mom live in the house. It wasn't until Entitled Mom made the claim that my grandma was senile that she finally listened to everyone's plea to have Entitled Mom kicked out. So because Entitled Mom questioned my grandma's sanity and state of mind, they had a psychologist question both my grandma and Entitled Mom. Now, Entitled Mom was racking up money to bribe the judge to rule in her favor. It's a third world country and people are desperate, so normally a judge would easily take it. However, this judge didn't take it, and the psychologist absolutely grilled Entitled Mom. According to her brother, who got roped into it unwillingly, he waited outside the room and could hear Entitled Mom yelling and crying and having a tantrum. Entitled Mom came out of the room crying. One of my aunts took my grandma to the psychologist and waited outside. This was the same psychologist that interviewed Entitled Mom. My grandma came out feeling fine. She wasn't like Entitled Mom. The courts denied Entitled Mom's claim that day. Entitled Mom was kicked out of the house with her kid. My grandma is sad to kick out the kid because it isn't his fault. However, Entitled Mom has been leeching off my grandma long enough. Everyone else has hated Entitled Mom for years and it was absolutely glorious hearing the news that the courts refused her claim to take my grandma's house and get the inheritance before my grandma passes. This isn't the first time Entitled Mom has tried to pull stuff like this and I would happily tell the stories of how Entitled Mom managed to get so much money and gifts in great detail. What would you do if you had a family member suing your grandma? Let me know. Night of the Living Karens A little about me. I'm in charge of four retail shops that cater to sporting goods that heavily focuses on hunting, but it's not limited to hunting. I put in a full 16 hours checking inventory, doing the billing and payroll. I decided to stop and shop for dinner at Walmart. I walk in wearing a black shirt that says, my rights don't end where your feelings begin. I hit the pre-made salad in Sandwich Island. Nothing. I move around to the burrito area. I hear an ahem <laughs> behind me. I figured I was in the way and moved out of the way. I hear the annoyed ahem <laughs> again, followed by an irate voice of a wild Karen. You should at least acknowledge me, sir. I look up and she begins to ask me if I am going to make any more sandwiches. I say, Madam, I don't work here. I do know, however, the sandwich people are gone for the day. They'll have more in the morning. She storms off talking to herself about how I was a rude associate. I shrug and continue shopping for my dinner. I move over to the pizza section and there's nothing. Yet while there, I get yelled at by another Karen. She demanded to know why I was out of uniform. I politely tell her, Madam, I don't work here. I then mosey off before she can speak to me further. While walking away, I hear her gasp and explain loudly to someone that I was very rude to her. In the frozen food aisle, looking for at least a bag of french fries or tater tots or even a frozen pizza, I hear another ahem <coughs> behind me. I push forward, thinking I am in the way again. I hear another ahem <coughs> followed by a hand on my shoulder. It's a Chad and a Karen. Chad is the one grabbing my shoulder. I push his hand off and turn to face him, telling him not to touch me and to get away from me. He recoils in horror and his Karen gasps. He demands to speak to my manager. I tell him, I don't work here. You can talk to the manager all you want. I then walk away as they storm off to the customer service center. I finally find food for dinner, a frozen bag of veggies and frozen chicken strips in the next aisle. I move on and grab some trail mix for breakfast and lunch tomorrow for work. I head to the sporting goods section to look at their new materials. I can sometimes find cheaper items there than at my own shops. I buy three boxes of turkey pew pew materials, the last three there. I hear a chad behind me howl in disgust. Why are you buying those? You work here, paying customers first. Those are mine by right, he legit shouts. I turn and politely tell him, Yes, paying customers first, and I am a customer who just bought them. I do not work here. His pet Karen chimes up. You certainly do work here. I see you here all the time. I explain, I don't work here. I am the owner of my business. I then walk away, leaving them fuming. The poor girl with the key to the pew pew material cabinet chimes up. He don't work here. They go off yelling at her about how she's covering for a thieving employee who's taking from customers to be a very rude and greedy person. I stop by office supplies and electronics to pick up some goodies. 
I then remember something from my list back in the food section. I go to get English muffins. I don't see the kind that I like, but I see the honey wheat ones and I grab three for the gazillion eggs I got at home. A wild Karen freaks out on me. You're an employee. You shouldn't be hoarding stuff. I politely tell her I do not work here and exasperatedly ask why does everyone think I'm an employee? I'm clearly not dressed like an employee. She comes back with, why else would you be in Walmart? I walk away laughing and retort, you must be a Walmart employee too. Why else would you be in Walmart? I'm looking over jewelry when Chad from Sporting Goods walks up and reaches into my carriage, taking out my three boxes of turkey pew pews. This was seen by Mark. Mark is the 62 year old store manager who is being followed by no less than 10 people all pointing at me, saying that I was the rude employee who they had been snubbed by. The Chad caught red-handed claims I stole them out of his card. Mark listens to them and all their complaints while keeping a smile. After they each said their piece, he proudly declares to the group, some of which had people who didn't even talk to me, upset about my choice of attire, that I do not work there and never have that I am a regular customer, but I own a number of sporting goods stores, and that he had bought products for his nephew to hunt with directly from me and saw me walk out of the office of the store. Many grumble and accuse him of playing favorites and protecting his employee, vowing to complain to corporate and never shop there again before disbanding. Mark turns to the Chad, still holding the three boxes of my turkey pew pews. You come with me. I follow Mark and Mark reviews the camera footage to determine who the boxes belong to. I even provide my receipt because I never walk away from sporting goods without paying. Mark turns to me and asks if I want to press charges. I agree and wait for the police. Chad is arrested and I fill out my witness statement. Mark does so as well and turns over a copy of the security footage and a photocopy of my receipt. I pay for my things and Mark compensated me with three bags of trail mix for the insanity of the store. We joke and exchange some talk about our respective businesses and the chaos. I wave and tell Mark I'll see him later and to drop by the shop that his new order had just come in and I'll throw in a goodie bag for him to thank him for the extra trail mix. I have survived the night of the living Karens in one piece. Never cheat for your kid. So back in high school, I was classmates with a kid who, well, wasn't exactly the sharpest tool in the shed. Take note, we were sophomores, grade 10, by now, so our batch had been together for 10 years. It's a small private school, so we were all pretty tight-knit. However, his mom believed he was the perfect little angel who would outshine everyone else. In reality, he only got those since his mom would bribe their way through the system to let the kid have the benefits, such as instead of trying out, the mom would pay their way into sports teams so he'd get credit only for him to be benched the entire game. The worst part was that as years went by, and to this day honestly, the kid bought into his mom's narrative and believed he was superior to many of us, with the mom making many outlandish claims. Among these tactics was something I'd noticed for a while. See, in the Philippines, instead of dividing the academic year and semesters, we had quarters, and within each quarter, we had two major long tests. Henceforth, I'll be referring to as LTs, then, after each quarter, we had a quarterly exam. Henceforth, I'll be referring to as QEs. As each quarter progresses, the QEs would aggregate lessons from the quarters that had passed along with that quarter's lessons. Anyway, for some time now, our class had noticed that the kid would call sick on the day of the major exams, and then the mom would call on the kids in the higher bracket grading who were supposedly close with the kid to ask for the exact content of the tests so that they could study it for the retest. Now, I'm not exactly a star student, okay, not at all, but my grades were decent enough for her to consider me within that call list. I mean, I hung out with the guy, and he was nice enough until his mom began inflating his ego. So during the third QE for algebra, surprise, surprise, the kid calls in sick. Now this was pretty expected since everyone had already been betting on it. Sure enough, by evening, the mom calls up asking exactly what was on the test, each question and answer. I tell her off and she starts spouting on about, grades are important, and I'm just caring for the future of my child, and he deserves to be in the honor society, and you should be more charitable. Uh, okay, whatever lady. By this point I'd had enough, so I comply, but with a twist. 
I end up giving her all the items of our second QE. Without a thought, she begins typing it down. I can hear her frantic fingers on the keyboard through the phone and begins taking down each and every word I say. Here's the kicker. Our algebra teacher did not even include lessons from the past QEs. She thanks me profusely and how I'm such a saint and a savior to her son. Ugh, quit the sweet talk, lady. Anyway, kid comes in, takes the test, and oh look, he got an F. To add insult to injury, our teacher was the one who'd put in the numerical percentage so we had a clear idea on how we did. Kid got a 35%. The mom confronts me and says, You lied. What you told me wasn't on the test. I played the ignorance card and said, Hmm, maybe he switched it up. They never bothered me again. He dropped from the honor society that year. People caught wind of the story and started doing the same thing. Parents, never spoon feed your kids. It never works out well. We're in college now and all updates on the kid's college life are non-existent. We don't even know if he's in college. Every time we have a reunion, he's evasive on the topic, despite everyone openly talking about their ups and downs on uni life. Last we heard, the mom was claiming her little Einstein was taking a double degree. We have a classmate whose uncle is a professor in the said degree, and he said he's never heard of the kid there. Entitled parent yells at me for being good at laser tag. Cast. We've got me, we've got annoying kid, we've got entitled mom, we've got staff, and friend. Background. I was invited to friend's birthday and it was at a place with a laser tag arena and I'm pretty good at it. I arrived quite early to the birthday so I soon guaranteed my place in the line. It was the right move because there was a line to enter it and to make the line move faster the rules were free for all with about 10 people in the arena each time. And when you lost, you exit the arena and give your equipment to the next kid in the line. Once I was inside, I defeated some enemies and was still with all my lives. Everything was okay until I defeated annoying kid. He was younger than me and I had defeated him before. So he went through the entire line again before I defeated him the second time. Annoying kid after recognizing me. Hey, how are you here if I entered the line before you? Me, I simply didn't lose my lives. That's not possible. You're cheating. Me. Go and lie to someone else while running to get another enemy. So while I was running near the arena entrance, the door opened and the staff called me. So I exited the arena and went to see what he wanted. Staff. It's him? Annoying kid. Yes, it is. Entitled mom. Before I even realize what's happening. So? You're the one that's cheating and defeating my angel. Me. I'm not cheating. My son said that you are cheating. So yes, you're cheating. And I'm sure that if Staff looks at your gear, he will see that you're cheating. Staff, let me check your gear. I give him the gear so he can check it. Staff tells Entitled Mom, nothing is wrong with his gear. Staff to me, you can go back in the arena. But he's been in the arena for more than 20 minutes and my angel stayed less than five minutes each time. But ma'am, the rules are clear. You're only eliminated when you're defeated and he hasn't lost yet. But this isn't fair. He played more than my son. Ma'am, please calm down. I only work here. I'm not the one who created the rules. At this moment, I decide to return to the arena, where I stayed until annoying kid entered the arena again, and somehow convinced six of the other players to come after me. I had defeated some of them before. So seven kids rushed at me, and even though I managed to defeat four of them, including annoying kid, they were able to defeat me. At this point, I only had half of my life's remaining. So after that, I returned to the line and managed to return to the arena. But after half of the other players decided to go against me again, I decided to go and do something else. I just remember Entitled Mom and Annoying Kid looking mad at me every time they saw me. If you're wondering, Annoying Kid was only at the party because Entitled Mom was friend with Friend's Mom. Like some of the other kids, he was able to convince to attack me. So I had never met him before. Stop making noise after 10 p.m.? Alrighty then. Some time ago, four years and change to be precise, my best friend and I moved into a nice house with a cool inner garden and a tiny living room looking out into it. We, 20 at the time, weren't really into partying, but as most university students still had some friends who would come over two to three times a month in twos or threes to hang out, bake, drink some wine and chill. Nice times. Once the weather got warm enough, we would sit in the garden and talk. And here, you'll just have to take my word that we were only talking once the clock hit 2200, 
as that's when the official night hours start around here. So no shouting, not even the quietest of music, no more than four people having a chill conversation in their own backyard. Working and studying, mind you, doesn't leave much time for such luxuries, so again, that's no more than twice a month. Across the fence, there lived a just-no family. An older lady and her husband in one house, and her daughter, toddler, grandkids, and two small obnoxious dogs barking all day, every day, and the next, both sharing a garden bordering on ours. Two meter high concrete wall between us and them. Additionally, we had never met them in person until they started showing up at 2205, demanding that we go inside and close all windows so as to not be heard at all. Because otherwise, we are a great awful inconvenience, super loud, and an absolute breach of the rules. Not true, but the constant bickering, threats, and calls to the landlord spoiled any enjoyment of the garden and summer evenings for us. The final straw was when the husband appeared at 2202, so he had obviously been waiting to lecture us as to how we can be as loud as we want, but no later than 2200, because in this community, we have rules. Alrighty then, cue malicious compliance. Both of us enjoy a wide variety of musical genres, jazz, blues, swing, classical, folk, the occasional pop or rap track, you name it, and rock and metal abundantly. So for the next two years, every evening with nice enough weather, the time from 2100 to 2200 became the neighborhood musical education hour. And at this point, it ain't jazz either and is as loud as we darn well please. We're having a blast unwinding from the day incorporating all cooking and showering into a dance routine. Then, all music stops at the strike of 2200. Yes, we have an actual church with actual bells that rings even at the time of the night. And on and on, evening after evening, till the leaves start to fall and it gets too cold to blast some nice Ramstein or Pink Floyd or whatever through the huge living room window. They tried to complain to the landlord about it too, but at this point, he told them that they got exactly what they asked for and to buzz off. Only thing we hear from the other side of the fence nowadays is them screeching at their dogs, and they lived happily ever after. Homeless looking guy actually does work in the building. So, years ago, I got a pretty sweet gig working as a security guard, shift supervisor actually, important, a building downtown. It was a mixed-use building, so we had a food court, retail stores on two levels, as well as five office towers. When I first started, one of the things all the guards are taught is to treat everybody they deal with respectfully. The building did have a lot of transients and homeless people wander through, but we prided ourselves on being courteous and polite to everyone. Well, one lazy Sunday morning, I get a frantic call from our building operator, guy who watches all the security cameras telling me I need to get to a specific bank of chairs on the second floor. He's panicking and I can't make out much of what he's saying other than one of my guard's names. I go rushing over, worried about this guard who's a bit of a loudmouth bully and he might be in a fight or something. Oh boy, do I wish that was the case. When I get there, the guard is berating an older gentleman who is seated in one of the chairs. Guy has a pile of paper and a coffee on the table in front of him and is pretty shabbily dressed. A pair of threadbare jeans, dirty running shoes, a faded and stretched out t-shirt, and a leather jacket that has more scuffs than leather at this point. There's a ratty laptop bag on the floor leaning against the table. The guard is darn near purple in the face, screaming at this guy to get out, pointing wildly and yelling about how we don't allow pieces of garbage to live here. You've been here an hour. Move along. I walk up, tell the guard to cool his heels. Hey guard, let's all just take a breath. What's going on here? And then I greet gentleman in the chair and ask what seems to be the problem. The second gentleman gets two words out. Guard lights up on a tangent about how this homeless dude is loitering and needs to leave but won't get up. I shush him and try talking to the gentleman again and this time he got out four words before the guard interrupts again and this time starts threatening to literally flip the chair forward to toss the gentleman onto the floor. I finally have enough with the guard and tell him to go to the office and cool off and that I will deal with the gentleman. Guard begrudgingly leaves, and I apologize to the gentleman about the guard's overreaction. Gentleman basically says, I appreciate it. I work in X Tower on X floor and forgot my keys. I was waiting till my assistant arrives and can let me in. I automatically offer to let gentleman into his office. We do all the time and have specific protocols for it, and he accepts. So away we go to the elevator. 
We reach the floor and then doors open, which is when I realize where I am. Every single night, we patrol every single office space of every single tower, except for one. On one floor, the entire space is occupied by a legal firm that is worth multi-millions, and we aren't allowed in the office, ever. Yup, I'm standing on that floor. Gentleman steps into the floor lobby, and I have to excuse myself to go and get the key for his office. We aren't allowed to carry a copy of it, so I can let him in, and he just nods. I race down to the building operations room, snag the key, and race back as fast as I can. When I get back to the floor, I open the office door and gentleman invites me in as he goes to shut off the alarm. I then have to awkwardly ask him for his ID and to see his office so I can verify that he's allowed to be there. He chuckles and obliges me. He's the owner of the legal firm. Thanks me for letting him in and I leave. About 20 minutes later, the president of our security company arrives on site with two other people and guard who blew a gasket is escorted off site. Fired. As soon as I left lawyer, he called the manager of the building at home to have words and manager then called security company who came down personally. I got a nice compliment for how I handled things and I learned why we had the rule of treating everybody with respect. You don't want me in your class? Okay. Okay, so this took place a long time ago. I think it was in 2009. I was 14 years old, and for context, we live in a country that's not very familiar with English, especially in 2009. At this period, almost nobody used English in their daily life. No song translations, and all the media was in our native language. This resulted in really poor English lessons. We were learning since we were 11 years old, and we were studying simple stuff. For my part, I was always interested in languages, and I was traveling for sport as I was training better and started to do international kayak competitions. This resulted in me not only learning, but using English for three years. At that point, I already read two Harry Potter books in English, so I can say I was really bored in English class. I had little time to do my homework because I was training a lot. And boy, we had a lot of homework. I was studying science, math, English, German. None of them were being my native language and art and this resulted in a lot of stuff to do after class. So when the year started, I especially chose a place at the back of the classroom for the English lessons. Usually in English, the teacher gives an exercise, waits for everybody to finish it, then asks the student to resolve the beginning of the exercise. If he does not know, she goes to ask the next student, etc., until all of the exercise is solved. This permitted me to resolve the exercise in five minutes and do my homework during 15 minutes while listening to the answers or correcting in five minutes with all the correct answers written on the blackboard. Not to brag, but to me, it was really easy, and I was not correcting a lot of my first answers. And you may ask, how did I do when she asked me to answer? Well, my answers were ready, so it was easy. I had been doing this for years with several English teachers, and as I was not disturbing the class, none of them were annoyed by that. But her, she did not like it. So the first time she noticed was in the middle of the year. I was stuck on a math problem and I had not followed how far she was in the exercise and what she asked for. So of course, I asked her to repeat the question. I think that's the first time she has looked at my desk. Her face was priceless. I had two different exercise sheets, three mathematical formula sheets, a pile of draft sheets filled with calculation, a lot of colored pens, a ruler and a calculator, while her exercise were on a single sheet and I should have an English book open to help me do the exercise. Her. Where is your English book? Me. Oh, I have it. It's in my bag. Why don't you have it in front of you? I don't need it. Obviously you do, as you cannot answer my question. But, and what are you doing anyway? Put all that useless stuff in your bag and open your English book. So, being non-confrontational, I obliged for the rest of the lesson. It was boring. The next lesson, I really needed to do my homework, and I did not want to lose that much time as I did during the last exam. So, as always, I started silently. I decided to do small homework, the type that only needs one sheet of paper so she would not notice. But she did, and she got mad. She asked me once again to put that use this stuff away, so I decided to do exactly what she asked. I put her English book and sheet in my bag. She shouted at me and sent me to the headmaster with an explanation note. The headmaster is the one supposed to punish you in our schools, for example, by giving detention. But just before I closed the classroom door, she made one last mistake. She shouted, And if my lesson does not please you, you are not forced to come to my class. Well, before that point, I was. I went to the headmaster. He asked a couple of questions and, 
As he knew my training situation, he did not give me detention. He just asked me to apologize to the teacher. And here finally comes the malicious compliance. I wrote a small letter stating, I am sorry I implied that the English book is useless. It is a well-written reference book that may be useful to 12-year-old students. Petty but relieving. Before the next English lesson, I put the letter on my desk and left before she arrived. I went to a room where students without a teacher can study calmly under the supervision of a school employee. Therefore, I was not doing anything against the rules of the school. If I was not under the supervision of a teacher, I had to be there. And this was the perfect place to do my homework. Of course, after 15 minutes, I get disturbed by a student from my class who states that she asks me to come back to class. I answered I was busy and she gave me the right not to come to class. That everyone heard her and if she wants to revoke that, she can see to this with my head teacher or with the headmaster. The student left and the end of the hour was quiet. A few days passed and of course, I am asked to go to the headmaster's office and she's there. My head teacher is there. The headmaster is there and to my surprise, my mother is there. My mom is also a teacher in this school, PE teacher, and she heard what happened and did not want to miss it. Headmaster, OP, please have a seat. Me, is it going to be long? We have a German lesson that I don't want to miss. English teacher, see, OP is always like that. Headmaster, don't worry, OP, you are excused for missing your lessons. Head teacher, so can you explain to us why you don't go to English class anymore? Me, well, I don't learn anything there and I have homework to do, as you may know. My head teacher was the science teacher. She gave a lot of homework. English teacher, you could do it at home like everyone else. That's why it's called homework. Mom, she is training two to four hours per day, and I can assure you she is also doing homework at home. Headmaster, do you really need this extra time to do your homework? Me, yes, four hours per week, it is a lot. Head teacher, I don't understand why you did not have this problem before. Me because I was already doing them during the English lesson. English teacher just never noticed because I was not disturbing the class. Headmaster, I see. English teacher, there is no way she is doing her homework in my classroom. This classroom is for English only. Me, I'll do them in the study room then. You allowed me not to come to your class. I don't see why there is a problem. Mom smiling, indeed, I don't see the problem. English teacher, but the exam. Oh, don't worry about your exam. I will still succeed. Mom, but we will be asking for an external jury if English teacher is acting like this. This is something we can do in my country if we have suspicion of non-correct teachers. Headmaster, well, as I see it, not going to the English class is not helping you to succeed in the English exam. So this would be your choice and your risk. If you make this choice, you may not come back on your decision and complain if you fail. Me, I know. Headmaster, I will see with the secretary if we can make some kind of official paper for this. Maybe we'll be happy to have her parents' signature as well, Mom. Mom, trusting me. With pleasure. Headmaster. Head teacher, would you agree to this decision as you know OP better than me? Head teacher. I don't know how she does in English, but she is working hard in science, and I think we can trust her decision making it for herself. I would be disappointed to see her homework not be turned in on time, and it is her English exam after all. English teacher. But, headmaster, and I don't think you will need an external jury as I will reread OP's English exam myself after correction. You agree, English teacher? I guess so, headmaster. Then it's settled. Have a nice day. That's his way of asking us to leave. And like that, the end of the year went smoothly. I had more time to do my homework, and I succeeded her exam. Entitled ants want to decide who I marry. OP stands up for himself for the first time. Cast. We've got OP. We've got Entitled Ant 1, wife of my mom's oldest brother. We've got Entitled Aunt 2, wife of my mom's older brother. We've got Cousin 1, Entitled Aunt 1's married daughter, my oldest cousin. We've got my mother, who was too sweet to say anything against anyone to their face. So a while back, I decided to introduce my girlfriend to my family and start having a mature discussion about me wanting to marry her and seeking their blessing. The challenge was that she was from a different religion. This was during a long weekend associated with a festival and my extended family had gathered around at my grandmother's place. Things were going well and I just pulled in the wedding of my older cousin into the discussion and soon the conversation came to where I wanted it to come to. My wedding. Hooray! Boy, I was wrong. I wasn't being asked for an opinion there. Entitled Aunt One. When it comes to OP's wedding, I think we should all have a say as to who does he marry. 
same woman who informed about her daughter's, my first cousin, wedding just a week before that happened, but wants full control of my wedding. How cute. Entitled Aunt 2. Yes, he is the only boy in our side. All my cousins on my mom's side are girls, and we have to be 100% involved in his wedding. So, it is only fair we get to decide the girl. The place is India, and arranged marriage is still lurking around here. Help. I just peeped at my sister, and she gave me a sympathetic nod as if to let me know that she understands how horribly all of this is turning out for me. In a while, on the table were names of girls they knew that would be a good fit for me and more garbage, so I decided to man up. Me. Actually, I have a girlfriend. I showed them pictures of her, and then when they got to know that she's from a different religion, they lost their crap. My parents were calm, upset at me for doing this without discussing it with them first, but calm. So that was a huge relief. My uncles were calm too. They were asking logical questions like, when do I plan to proceed? Do I have enough savings for a wedding and more stuff? But not my aunts. They were wailing and whining about how I was going to ruin the family reputation and how I am ruining the name of my parents. How my aunts would have to be ashamed in front of all their family and the rest of the world because I decided to pick my partner. I have always been the nice kid in the family, had zero rebel traits, was always soft-spoken, so telling them about my girlfriend itself was a big move on my part. The next argument from Entitled Aunt 1 was how my mother has raised me wrong and that it is what has triggered the whole love in me. Entitled Aunt 2 He is going to set a bad example for the rest of the kids around here. Entitled Aunt 1 Yes, look at your cousin. She never fell in love with any man and quietly married the boy we chose for her. She's so happy. Cousin 1 is in a horrible marriage with zero guts to divorce. She never had any guts to stand up for herself and I'm guessing you can figure out why. My mom cried a bit, and that is when I realized that, one, what the heck was I thinking? Two, I need to step up or have all my cousins give up on their dreams because their brother could not stand up for himself. Me, entitled ants one and two, you guys practically raised me when I was very young. I know you love me a lot. Entitled ant one, now calming down a bit. Yes, we do. Me, I am 25 now. I would be marrying in another two years and I would probably live to see 65. So how much is that? 40 more years and 38 years of marriage? I hardly get to see you these days. How many days do we see each other? Five days a year? Let's consider one week. So in the next 40 years of my life, you'd be seeing me for 40 weeks. And you might get to see my partner even less than that. Let's say 20 weeks. That is just five months or less. Can't my loving aunts pretend to like my wife for 140 days for me? And all of this, assuming that you'll be alive to see me turn 60. It would break my heart if you died before I did. The dinner was a very silent affair that day. Would you marry someone that your relatives didn't approve of? Please let me know. Me and Karen, a love story. Just kidding, Karen is a total jerk. But buckle up, because here is my novel. My husband and I are in our late 30s and child-free. Some people on child-free said I should post here too, so enjoy the saga. My husband and I had been saving up for almost a decade to move to a tropical paradise. About two years ago, we bit the bullet and moved to our dream location. Housing here is super expensive, like Hawaii prices, so all we could afford was half of a duplex. It is beautiful and on the water with places for our boat. Unfortunately, Karen, Billy Bob, the boyfriend, and her three gremlins live in the other unit. Set up. There is some period of time we just went for a week here and there, but we live here full time now. The entire duplex was owned by an older gentleman who rented out both sides. The sides do not match at all. One side is a five bedroom, three bath. The other side of the duplex is a two bedroom, one bath. We bought the five bedroom. On our side of the property, we have 90% of the backyard, a gazebo, and dockage, about 150 feet since it's on a corner. The other side has a small backyard, patio, and maybe 15 feet of dockage. The rental leases say the renters are entitled to their specific backyards, but there were no fences or anything, so all the renters shared the entire backyard. After we bought the house, Karen immediately tried to throw her weight around that they expected to continue with that privilege. I told her if she asked politely, we would try to accommodate her. 
She thought this meant she could use our backyard whenever she wanted. Party incident. One day, my husband and I are enjoying some drinks outside when a delivery truck shows up to set up a giant blow up thing in our backyard. I asked Karen what she thought she was doing and she said it was for her kid's birthday. Then she had the gall to say it was a family and friends only event so we had to stay inside our house. Not wanting to be a total jerk and ruin some little kid's birthday, I told Karen after this she had no access to our backyard, period. Karen shrugged and kept setting up for the party. During the party, a drunk idiot wandered into our house which shocked us all. I said Karen's house is the other side and he said, Oh, Karen said she owned the whole property and to use whichever bathroom was available. I directed him to Karen's bathroom and soon after she came storming into our house, screaming about how dare we make her look bad to her friends and how selfish we are we couldn't even spare one bathroom. She said we didn't deserve all this space with just us. I told Karen to get the heck out of my house or I would be calling the cops. She finally left and the party wrapped up shortly after. Backyard Remodel After the party incident, we decided we needed to clearly define the backyard and build a fence. While we were spending the money, we decided to update the patio, put in a fire pit, and an outdoor kitchen. While the contractor was on site, nosy Karen had to come investigate. Since the fence would be the last thing built, I was vague and just stuck to telling her about the patio update. You could see her face light up because of course in her mind, what's ours is hers. When the workers started on the fence, Karen came out screaming for the work to stop. I went outside and told the workers to keep working and told Karen to butt out. Of course, in true Karen fashion, she called the cops. What happened next was hilarity on my part after explaining to the cop that we were building a fence on our property and the landlord, of which Karen was not, knew about it. When the cop gave Karen a stern lecture, I thought her head was going to explode. She went back into her house and slammed the sliding door so hard it sounded like something cracked. We got our fence and I thought that would be the end. But of course not. The boat incident. One day, Billy Bob entered the picture and he was as much of a terrible neighbor as Karen was. He would throw cigarette butts and empty beer cans over our fence for disrespecting his woman. I didn't know Paradise had these kinds of folks, but Billy Bob really took the cake. Billy Bob has a boat, a 30-foot fishing boat to be precise. Of course, that side of the duplex only has 15 feet of dockage. Since we have so much dockage and only one boat, we rent out the other dockage spot as a month to month. People come and go, so if we don't receive rent from them by the end of the month and the boat disappears, we think nothing of it. We had a renter who tied up their boat on the property line, but Billy Bob wanted to park his boat and needed that space. Karen and Billy Bob posed as us. We were out of town, told the renters to be gone at the end of the month, and then parked Billy Bob's boat on the dockage. I only found out about it weeks later because the renter left a nasty review on the rental site we use. They said we were rude and went back on the verbal agreement to let them stay for three more months. I was like, what the heck is all this? After a phone call, I quickly put two and two together. I called the cops who told Karen and Billy Bob they need to move their boat or it would be towed, the equivalent of it anyway. Karen and Billy Bob started screaming the boat is fully on their property. It isn't. Then changed to no one can own the water. True, but a seawall is deeded. That we are liars and at some point Billy Bob punched a cop and went to jail. I felt bad for the cops so took them all snacks the next day with a note apologizing for neighbor drama. I ended up winning my small claim suit against them for lost rental income, but of course haven't seen a dime. I eventually convinced the dockage renters to come back and gave them a few months free as compensation. Final Revenge If you've made it this far, congratulations. Get ready for the juicy justice part. So with the collapsing market, we were trying to figure out what to do with our savings when a perfect opportunity opened up. The landlord, who owned both properties, was in desperate need of some cash and was tired of managing the property from 2,000 miles away because, of course, Karen is a Karen and calls him weekly for every little thing. His only stipulation was we let the poor single mom who has been his renter for eight years finish her lease, which is up in July. Since we just have money, we were trying to reinvest and because now we get to control our neighbors, heck yeah, we jumped on that. Since we didn't need a realtor or mortgage and an inspection had been done just a week ago for the old landlord's refinance 
Everything closed in just under two weeks. Karen was unaware of a change of ownership. We registered the property under an LLC, but didn't know who until eight days ago. I went over to Karen's house and knocked on the door. Karen answered with a, what the heck do you want, jerk? I smiled, handed her our landlord information and sweetly reminded her rent was due by Friday, but she could just hand me the check if that was easier. I've always heard descriptions of people's faces turning white, but this was the first time I have actually seen it. I told Karen that we are honoring her lease until the end of July, but afterwards she had better make plans to move because we intend to remodel it before these next tenants moved in. Bye Karen. Don't touch my horse. He bites. I own a beautiful horse, Chip. He's a brown and white palomino with a half gone fuzzy winter coat. Yeah, he looks like a rat right now. Clumps of fur everywhere. He has these amazing blue eyes and I'm so happy to have a horse with blue eyes as they make him show emotions so much more clearly than our other two horses, KC and Buddy, both having brown eyes. He has a long mane and tail with a very heavy bang. He's naturally chubby, but puts on extra pounds in the winter. I love him very much, but he is such a brat. He nips and bites, and no matter what I do, he won't stop. We refer to him as Sir Sass if we are annoyed with him. He gets lippy if you get near his mouth, and if agitated, he will bite. I never let anyone touch his mouth. He lives next to a road, so he's used to cars, but loud noises and sudden approaches still scare him. On to the story. This just happened today, a windy but warm day. I've done nothing the past few days due to what's going on. I'm sure many of you are in the same situation. I decide I might as well start getting Chip into shape, and it's such a nice day. Go out, run him in our arena, brush, tack him up, and we're off. I decide to take a trail I frequently use. It's somewhat busy occasionally, but it allows horses and has paved paths. It's a bit muddy in spring, but I don't mind. We get about halfway at a slow trot. He's behaving beautifully, and I'm so proud of him for not acting like a complete jerk. In a good mood, I do not notice Entitled Parent approaching. With a sudden jolt, Chip startles. Entitled Parent has marched up to me and grabbed him by the bridle. Do not do this. I reach out, yanking her hand off. What are you doing? I demand, glaring at her. I back Chip up a few paces, putting space between us. She stares at me. Horses aren't allowed on these trails, you jerk. Are you trying to get someone hurt? This is clearly a sick and diseased animal, she shouts, drawing attention. She advances, preparing to grab Chip again. I back him up. Stay away, he's nippy. I warn, patting him. Lo and behold, she ignores me and continues lunging, trying to grab him. I'm starting to panic. Finally, I dismount and holding his reins, face her. He's not sick, he's shedding his winter coat. If you knew anything about horses, you would know this. I, in fact, own a horse. He never grows a coat and sheds it, she states, as if trying to prove me wrong. We are up north. All horses grow winter coats here, lady. In fact, it's likely her horse is probably not growing a coat because it's sick. God knows. She suddenly lunges, taking me by surprise. She snags the reins out of my hand. Chip lets out a neigh and instinctively, sure enough, bites her right on the hand. She screams, letting go. I quickly pick up the reins before he can bolt and awkwardly get on him, patting him and trying to stop him. He's having a horse panic attack, making small bucks and rears. Meanwhile, Entitled Parent is screaming, calling my horse rabid, me irresponsible for not watching my horse. People who are watching earlier are staring in horror. Her hand is bleeding everywhere. Finally, I get control of Chip. She starts screaming, firing insults at me, said I let my horse bite her. My fault that my horse is rabid. Someone calls the police. They show up with an ambulance and she's taken to the ER. Spent the entire afternoon having to explain that no, my horse does not have rabies. No, it was not my fault. And no, I did nothing to her. Police understand that he's just shedding. Witnesses are asked and confirm my claims. So basically, she said this. I was riding on a trail where horses are not allowed. Horse bit her for no reason. He has rabies, a skin disease, and I insulted her and made Chip bite her. Thank God for the witnesses. Her hand is fine, so far as I know. Don't think I'll be riding Chip on that trail anytime soon. Turns out the lady didn't even own a horse, so I guess her imaginary horse doesn't shed in spring. How interesting. Boss tried to be slick changing my employment, ended up having to pay me more than what he thought. To give some background for the story, 
I was working as a legal assistant at a small law firm, but started off as the receptionist. This was a job I could get straight out of college while I give myself some time to adjust to adulting life and getting ready to apply to graduate slash law school. He fired a coworker over her asking for a higher raise and immediately told me I was going to take over. The law firm has eight employees and has a high turnover rate and I didn't realize until a couple of months ago. My boss is a stereotypical boomer and gloats about how he was in the army, how he's a ladies man, even though his wife is literally our office manager and doesn't train his employees, even though he forces his employees to sign a contract saying they will have to pay $2,500 if they don't complete one year. Over the past months, he has tried to say my work is terrible, even though I used all of his templates and had to correct him with information I received from the court on how to do these exact family pleadings and I have closed cases that have been with us for years in the span of one to three months. Blames me for being rude to clients even though the clients told him it was not me and was another coworker who he showed favoritism to and consistently asked me if I found the right man. Would I be with that man after he met my girlfriend at the firm's annual holiday party? There's a lot more, but too much to write. Overall, he hated anything about me and my coworkers would often have to vouch for me because he would take out his anger on me. Because of this, I made sure to always send emails of our conversations and clarify things in order to keep track of all the shortcomings and issues. I even had a meeting with my officer manager and documented the fact that I wasn't trained by sending a follow-up email and screenshotting an email where they made me train a new person one week after I started. Someone please tell me if this looks like adequate training. Three weeks ago, he changed my contract to being a non-essential employee and told my coworker before she quit that he lessened my hours because of my poor work and anything I did could be sent by mail or email. He often rushes through his work and leaves a lot of loopholes in his contract, so cue the malicious compliance. The contract said that I would be a non-essential employee and by the way he wrote it, he capped phone calls at 0.5 of an hour, but I would get paid $15 per call, $45 for each family packet I did and $15 per email correspondence. So I did a couple of family pleading packets, but kept my coworkers in the loop and they told my boss that they were busy with other things and asked if I could make the calls. They knew I am the only one in my household working and felt the contract was terrible. I also asked them how they would read the contract and they interpreted it in the same way I had. Since I was deemed non-essential and he could not be bothered to draft a letter letting me go into the office, I had to send various emails for him to print. When he would ask for me to place items on his desk, I referenced my contract stating I was a non-essential employee and could risk a fine slash jail time. I ended up making so many calls, always tried to make them as long as possible by asking clients how are they and hearing them complain about what's going on and how difficult it will be for them to make payments at this time. That when I sent my hours to my office manager, she cc'd my boss and asked to verify hours and explain. I explained and broke it down with my contract. My boss couldn't be bothered to go back to his email and asked me to forward the contract. At that point, it took them forever to respond and I was eagerly awaiting their response. He attempts to spin it back and change the wording of my contract to say each call was only 75 cents and each correspondence was only $1.50. This would essentially make my paycheck only less than $100 even though I had originally been paid $15 an hour and had worked 50 plus hours in the past two weeks. At that point, I send my resignation and screenshots of all the times I asked how do they want the timesheets sent along with the governor's stay-at-home order for non-essential employees. He attempted to change the story to say that I was an essential employee and finally offered to give me a letter, but at that point, I had already sent my resignation. After reading my email referencing the contract, lack of training, and mentioning the conversation with his wife, he conceded, made an agreement that I was leaving on good terms and is giving me the wages I deserve. Moral of the story, document everything and follow up. I have a second round interview, so please wish me luck. It's a hard time, but we'll get through it. Get your own dang spoon. So I used to work in a really big whiskey bar in my town that also catered for dinner and coffee slash cake sort of things. I had worked there for a couple years, so I guess I was recognizable to a few people and maybe some that hadn't realized I had moved on. I was really good friends with all the staff in there so I used to come in for a pint and a chat occasionally. The uniform in the whiskey bar is black shirt slash tee and black bottoms, and being a bar person, I happen to wear an awful lot of black on a daily basis, 
even in my newer job, which is casual dress. So this one evening, I call in for a drink, and I'm sitting at the bar, waiting for the bartender to finish serving this woman next to me. After about 10 seconds, I realize she's absolutely going out of her way to make life a living heck for the server. She's trying to pay for a bunch of stuff separately, but wants specific changes for each thing, for reasons unknown. And while the guy serving her is doing everything to accommodate her, she creates a new problem with every interaction. Complains that there's too much coins slash not enough coins, the cream on the coffee doesn't look nice enough, etc. and gets quite rude and aggressive, sending her server running back and forth, a bit bizarre. The bartender is a chill guy and does his best to meet her requirements and offers the two Irish coffees she just ordered on the house by way of apology for not understanding her. She mutters something under her breath along the lines of, Yeah, dang right, while outwardly expressing her impatience by huffing and tapping her phone loudly on the counter. The bartender serves the drinks and smiles, apologizing again. I'm sitting at the end of the bar near where the sugars, spoons, and milk for coffee is, in my black ensemble. The woman turns to me and just says, Spoon, without looking at me. Excuse me? I reply, taken a bit back. Give me a dang spoon, she says, right in my face. I looked her dead in the eye and I responded, I don't work here. I ordered my beer and she went a marvelous shade of red and scuffled off back into whichever pit she had ascended from. She never got her dang spoon. So Karen, what did you think of today's stories? They were horrible. Horrible? How dare you? These were some of the best we've ever read. Oh, shut up, Mr. Reddit. It's ridiculous what people like myself have to go through. Dealing with stupid people like yourself and your subscribers. Look, Karen, you can say whatever you want about me, but don't you talk about my re-army. Tch, <laughs> re-army. Most of your viewers aren't even subscribed to your channel. 70% if I'm correct. Well, I can't argue with that. That's true, most... Most of my viewers don't actually subscribe for some reason. It's because you're stupid, Mr. Reddit. No, I'm not. All right, guys, let's prove Karen wrong by making sure you're subscribed to the channel and turn on notifications. Pah, they're not going to listen to you. And if you'd like me or Karen what to record a special message for you, come visit me on Fiverr, link pinned in the comments below. Never. And join as a channel member today and Karen will give you a special shout out in the next video. Like heck I will!